call you when you screw up. Even Good afternoon, baseball fans. We're broadcasting live on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network, getting set to watch a game between the Lynchburg Hornets, still undefeated at home, hosting the William Peace Pacers. Lynchburg gets a key win yesterday on this diamond against Randolph-Macon, key ODAC conference win. They also keep that undefeated streak intact here at home. Lynchburg beat Randolph-Macon 4-3, used 12 singles, and they had great support from their crowd. Everybody was into it. We were into to it. My name is Kyle Haney, Evan Gates. We saw so much fun stuff yesterday. We get to turn it around in less than 24 hours and do it again. Absolutely, Kyle. And as we know yesterday, Jack Batchmore coming in. Seems like every time that he goes on the mound, it's really a lock for Lynchburg if they're in the lead and against a ranked opponent as well. Very solid performance. But we know that this William Peace team is talented. They're going to bring their A game to Fox Field as we transition into the lineups for today's game. As we know, Josh Jorman will be on the mound for the Hornets. He has been solid all season long. We'll see what he can do, the senior out of Oak Hill. But for the Hornets, it's going to be Brandon Garcia, Logan Webster, Avery Neves, who is an eight-game on-base streak. We'll see if he can keep that today. Eric Hyatt, Sean Pokorock, Gavin Collins, Riley O'Donovan, Ben Jones, and Carson Atkins will round out the lineup for Lynchburg. For William Peace, they're 16 and 16 on the season. They're gonna start number 46, Anthony Pollard on the bump. And the lineup goes like this. It'll be number 26, the first baseman, Brent Kemp leading off. The designated hitter is Hunter Ward. Pat Rogan, the right fielder, will hit third. In the cleanup spot, it's Jake DeCunto playing shortstop. Jacob Norris is the third baseman batting fifth. Sean Rosenborough will catch and hit seventh. Adam Joseph, the second baseman. Then you get Cam Barefoot, the left fielder, and number 28, the center fielder, Nick Tyler, rounding out the batting order for William Peace. Coached by Charlie Long, just his second season at William Peace, but he's a baseball lifer. Coached 18 years at North Carolina Wesleyan and uh, won a national championship. So Charlie Long will bring some of that veteran coaching experience to the game today. And we're excited to have you along for the ride. Stick around. First pitch is coming up in just a moment on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network.
private education is too expensive? Think again. At the University of Lynchburg, you can get a personalized education for the cost of a state school. If you're commuting and you get our top scholarships, you could pay much less. And you get all that without the hassle of giant lecture halls. Our faculty know your name here and do more than just teach. You might even do research together and plan out your next career move. At Lynchburg, we don't fear change. We embrace it in our students, on our campus, in our community, and around the world. We're building on our legacy of always moving forward. It's the same place with a new name. Welcome to the University of Lynchburg. We're broadcasting live at Fox Field on the campus of the University of Lynchburg. Kyle Haney hanging out with Evan Gates, and we are set for baseball here. Non-conference action today, but it was a key conference win yesterday for the Hornets, Evan. They beat Randolph-Macon 14, or 4-3, to three, excuse me. That keeps Lynchburg at the top of the Old Dominion Athletic Conference standings. And they keep the undefeated streak alive here at Fox Field. Man, everybody was feeling good yesterday. The bats got 12 hits, bullpen held it down after a quality start from Brandon Pond. It was just a really fun day at the ballpark. Absolutely, and it felt like it was a must-win matchup, and the Hornets coming out in very strong fashion to get that one. As you mentioned, strong pitching. Brandon Pond went four and a third. Jack Batchmore there to close the door with four innings of solid work to earn the win. So the Hornets, as they continue rolling through ONAC play coming in the late stages of April, these are the types of games that you have to win, especially going into the conference tournament. There's the final out of the ball game right there from Batchmore, and you see the response from the dugout. They knew it was a big game. You nailed that, Evan. Just a monster win in front of a great crowd. Got some good shots of the crowd. Everybody was into it here on campus, and who knows? Maybe we'll see that matchup again down the road in tournament play. We're really only a couple weeks away from the ODAC tournament and potentially a NCAA regional tournament. But for now, it's a stiff non-conference test here for Lynchburg. William Peace, 16 and 16, but uh, the, the entire time before the game, you and I and everyone else has been talking about, don't let the record fool you for William Peace. They're a good ball club. This is the second time these two teams have met this season. Lynchburg got a win 11-10 in a high scoring affair a month and a half ago down the road in Raleigh. Absolutely, and a lineup that is certainly capable, and especially behind this guy, Brett Kemp, batting 4-12. He started every single game this season. A 1.171 OPS, which anything over one is going to be a pretty spectacular number. Kemp has come out, but obviously having to face Josh Jorman on the mound as well, someone else for the Hornets who has really contributed in the spots that he's come up big. We know that he's the senior out of Oak Hill, Virginia. He's had some appearances, if you remember, the first notable run, one really against CNU to get a big ranked matchup win earlier in the season, and really he's just continued to ride that momentum. It's been four starts for Josh Jorman this season, nothing out of the bullpen on the mound. Now, if you don't know, Josh Jorman is a very talented first baseman for Lynchburg, and he's actually hitting 390 swinging the bat. He will not be in the lineup today, 
as Coach Lucas Jones prefers him to just focus on pitching when he does take the ball for the start. It'll be a leadoff single for Brett Kemp, that guy that we were so excited to see. You can see why he's got those high numbers. Evan, a swing like that, staying through the middle, nice, short, compact. He's got some power, too. So does this man, Hunter Ward, the designated hitter for William Peace. Hunter Ward enters the ball game hitting 295. He's got a couple dingers and seven doubles, swings on the first offering from Jorman and fouls it away. And that single there for Kemp extends his on-base streak to 24 games. I mean, any time you can get someone in the lineup who has that consistency, especially when you're looking at the top three batters, that's something that you have to enjoy if you're the coach. Yeah, William Peace, it's a quality offense. Jorman has picked Kemp off. Rundown situation here. Garcia has it, forces Kemp out of the baseline, makes the tag anyway. But it's out number one, and I believe – if you're scoring at home, it's 1-3-6 on the put out there. So good job of the Lynchburg defense. Saw some great defense from the Hornets yesterday. We didn't really mention that in our, our little preview there and our recap from the ball game, but Jackson Harding ran down a potential double, took a hit away close to the warning track yesterday. Gavin Collins made a couple fine defensive plays in some big moments. So Lynchburg really getting it done on the mound, swinging the bat and with the glove as well. And we get to see a glimpse of that right there for the first out of the ball game. You understand if you're a Hornets fan too, especially after watching this Randolph-Macon matchup yesterday, when you have three teams in the top ten in the nation, you have to really be a disciplined ball club and do the little things right. And so for Jormund, even just with a pickoff after the first at bat, I mean that's so important because being able to sharpen your skills all around the diamond is something that you want to pay more attention to as we go into the ODAC tournament. 2-2 two, two count for Jorman. You get a great look at him on the mound there, working from the set position, the stretch, even though nobody is on first base. He misses low and in with that 2-2 two, two delivery, and now it'll be a full count to Hunter Ward, the designated hitter for William Peace. 16-16 and 16 for Peace. They got swept this weekend against Pfeiffer. That's another ball club that Lynchburg has played this season. The Falcons took all three of those games. Before that, William Peace had won five out of six. That was to begin the month of April. So it's somewhat of a roller coaster, I guess, for Charlie Long and his ball club. Not totally out of the ordinary for baseball teams. You, you win five in a row. You lose three in a row. You win four in a row. It's it's rare you're just going to win one, lose one, win one, lose one. That, that never really happens. So important to really keep your confidence up at a stage like that in the season as Dorman's pitch will be inside for the walk. But in that series, obviously, three games against Pfeiffer, this is a William Peace team that has averaged just under six walks a game this season. They had seven walks in those three games. And you think about maybe if your bats aren't working the way you want them to, you have to find ways to get on base, and I think that's where the Pacers came up a little bit short. But as we've mentioned, this is a talented team that knows how to get runs across the board. Yeah, that had been a big part of William Peace's game, those walks. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. They're actually ninth in the country in walks. So to still be in the top ten in that stat after only taking seven in three games, to your point, says a lot. Here's a ball that is hit hard by Pat Rogan, but the right fielder will make the grab pretty comfortably. That was Logan Webster who had to go a few steps back, but the ball just didn't really carry. And it'll be the shortstop, Jake DeCunto, hitting with two outs. And a runner on first. Lynchburg uses the walk as well. They've been walked 159 times this season. That's just over five. So they're in that category of a team that finds ways to get on base. Only the one walk yesterday that Lynchburg drew, and that's credit to Randolph Macon's quality pitching staff. Carson Atkins coming on to field that ball in one bounce. Now it gets away on the throw. Pinball off the brick in front of the dugout. And that is not what you want as a baseball coach to see that rolling around free across the infield. Jormund actually tried to dive and keep it off the wall. Couldn't do that. And the catcher, Sean Pokerock, comes over to snag it. But the uh, runner, Hunter Ward, was going to go first to third. Actually, I say that he might have been having to hold there at second, Evan. When I kind of recreate the play in my mind, I think Ward was going to have to stay at second, and then when the throw got away, he was able to advance. So did Jake DeCunto. I'd have to agree, and you saw about three outfielders right there with that infield just trying to 
limit that run to third, but it's little plays like that, little bloopers, that if you don't stay on top of it, you're going to pay in the end. And so now Lynchburg with two outs and a bit of a pressure situation early on. Jorman's got the high baseball IQ. He was going to the right place. He was over there to try to back up a potential throw. But he kind of got caught in between home and third. And honestly, the throw was so wild that unfortunately, I don't know if him being in the right place really would have mattered anyway. Great effort to try to dive after it, though. 1-1 one, one count as Jorman tries to pitch out of the trouble. Here's a hard hit ball to second baseman Ben Jones. Lynchburg is going to avoid any damage here. Still blanked after a half inning of play. And we'll get to see the Hornets bats for the first time when we come back in just a moment on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. has given me the flexibility to pursue my passions and my interests and I've recreated my identity for myself aside from just being an athlete. My greatest personal discovery has been that I am capable of doing things that I didn't know I was capable of doing. To be able to study what I wanted to and continue to play the sport I love, all of those things came together very nicely in one package in Division Three. Being a part of the different activities and organizations that I've been a part of, I'm actually able to see myself where I'm like, hey, I actually can make a change. I'm one person that can make a difference. Division three has helped me to develop teamwork skills, critical thinking skills, time management skills. It's not just about basketball or it's not just about school. It's about developing yourself as a person altogether. Pacers get a couple singles in the first inning, but Lynchburg defensively avoids surrendering any runs. There was a key pickoff in there to begin the inning. Kyle and Evan hanging out with you. We get to see Lynchburg's lineup for the first time today. It's Brandon Garcia leading off. He has quite a hot streak going, Evan. 14 games in a row with at least one hit, and he's got eight multi-hit games in that stretch. Brandon Garcia, a freshman from Durham, North Carolina. And what's so impressive about that streak, I think, is just the confidence he's bringing every single at bat. Because even if he's not getting a hit or even getting on base, he's finding ways to make the pitcher work to get the pitch count up. So see a pitch over his head. But for a freshman to come in and have the plate discipline, really, that this entire class has had, it's something special to see. He is facing Aubrey Pollard. Left-handed slinger from William Peace. This is start number eight on the season for number 46. He is just 0-1 on the year. The ERA is over eight, and he has struck out 15 and walked 30. So he's got the inverse of the ratio that you want there as far as Ks to walks. But you can see already that uh, Pollard brings something special to the mound there. Got the good frame, long arms, long legs. He's got that high leg kick. and. Really comes downhill at you. Got some velocity on the fastball, it looks like. I think he'll be a tough test for Lynchburg. See how quickly the Hornets can get to him. We know Fox Field can be a pitcher-friendly park in terms of not seeing that many homers. And so even if your ERA isn't the brightest, as Garcia will earn the walk to first, you have to come into every single game with a new mindset. And I think that Pollard is looking to make a dent and maybe have that ERA go down today. 20th walk of the season for Brandon Garcia. He started 21 ball games now, so basically a walk per game. And here comes Logan Webster. Did not get it at bat yesterday in the win against Randolph-Macon, but the sophomore back in the lineup today. Hits 269 on the season. 22 hits in there, a double and a homer to go along with 
14 driven in. Could be a sacrifice bunt situation. This was a low or a high scoring game rather the first time these two teams met Evan. 11-10. Lynchburg won that game down in Raleigh. Uh, that was on February 28th. So I said a month ago. It's, it's more than a month ago. Lynchburg only got six hits. Scored 11 runs, but only got six hits. So that tells you something. They took the walks. They got hit by pitch, which is a big part of Lynchburg's offensive attack as well. And they end up getting a one-run win. It was a one-run win yesterday. I think that makes Lynchburg 3-1 and one now in one-run games. That's a good stat, and that's a stat that – the good teams, typically, they have a better record in those one-run games. Not not always, but usually the cream kind of rises to the top in those close games. If you're Coach Jones, those are the types of games that are going to earn you a very solid position in this postseason. Lynchburg seems like every single time they've been tested, they have been able to deliver. And an interesting point with the Shenandoah doubleheader coming up on Saturday – you wonder how much of this bullpen will be used today. We know that Jorman might not be an inning eater in terms of how long he'll go. We know he's a position player, but boy, is he capable of staying on the mound. So we'll see what Lucas Jones has in mind. There's one of those dirt ball reads from Brandon Garcia. He is so good at that. Ball out of the pitcher's hand. He's reading it with a low release. He's anticipating that it's going to hit the dirt before it gets to the catcher. And he takes off. He, he doesn't really even wait to see how far the carom goes away from the catcher. He's already gone. By the time the catcher gets to it, it's too late. Hey, Garcia's been burned on that, I think, one time this year. But his success rate is just incredible with those breaking balls in the dirt. It's not a true steal. He's waiting for it to hit the ground as Webster fouls another one away. He's put together a really good at bat here, a long at bat. It's just a 2-2 count with nobody out. In the bottom of the first inning, still no score between Lynchburg and William Peace. If you're Garcia, I think those quick decisions will start to really pay dividends because, I mean, that success ratio that you mentioned, getting caught stealing once isn't something to be concerned about. Webster checked the swing. It was a close pitch anyway. Didn't really get a long hold frame job from the catcher, so maybe he realized it was out of the zone, and now it's a full count. See if Logan Webster can finish off what has really turned into a pretty good at bat, especially the first time facing a tough arm like Pollard here. Brandon Garcia leads off at second. Shortstop keeps him close with a kick. Garcia shoots it up the middle. Or excuse me, Webster shot it up the middle. Garcia was in no man's land. Does manage to get back to second after a throw from the first baseman. How about a heads-up play from Pollard on the mound, especially to give that nod back to second. Situation where Garcia already a few steps off. You throw that ball to first, and you never know if he's going to try and make something happen at third. But still with the runner in scoring position, it's the All-American Avery Neves at the plate. Two hits yesterday for Neves, including what turned out to be the game-winning RBI in the bottom of the seventh inning. Lynchburg got a few runners on for an insurance possibility in the eighth, but did not score them. And then, obviously, Lynchburg, the home team, didn't need to bat in the bottom of the ninth with the 4-3 lead. But Neves, as usual, was key. His first hit of the game was just a rocket over the shortstop's head. Seems like Neves might be just close to catching fire again. You really get that feeling. He's never really been off all season. He's only had, I think, the one game where he hasn't reached base but it feels like he could be getting ready to start a tear where he gets two, three, four hits a game type of a situation. And he puts in the work. He's one of those guys after a game, you go talk to Coach Lucas Jones and the rest of the staff, and a lot of times Neves will be down there in the batting cage. I think that was the way when we worked together a week or so ago, Evan, we were hanging out by the dugout, and there's four or five guys after the game just getting extra hacks in. That's what separates good ball clubs from the great ones, and – the expectation for this Hornet squad with where they are sitting right now record-wise is certainly high as Neves is going to earn one. An RBI and a chance for two. And he slides easily into second. Garcia scores, and we've got a one nothing ball game. Full package right there from Avery Neves. You get to see all of what makes him a box office star kind of a player. He hits that ball hard, just a rope in the gap. So there's your base hit. It's another RBI, 
and then he uses the speed and just the hustle to get a double out of it. When, you know, you got to say the center fielder, Nick Tyler, he cut that ball off quickly. He knew that Neves was thinking two off the bat and made a pretty good throw to second. But with Neves' speed, he's just one step ahead of that. And it's an RBI double for Avery Neves. He'll take off and try to steal third, and he'll get there with the head first slide. You really are getting to see everything from Avery Neves. He's in the bag early today, Evan. And that's about as good of a throw down the line as you can get if you're Roseboro, but Neves knew right away from the pitch that he was going to get third and pays off. Neves is the career leader in, uh, in a lot of categories, but it's interesting. Everything he just did there, he's actually second all-time at the University of Lynchburg in. That's a double. He's second all-time in doubles. He, uh, he will need 46 to tie Stephen Scott in that category. He's second all-time in RBI. He's closing in on that all-time record, but he's second right now. And he's second in stolen bases, too. So he added to those totals. He, he inched his way up the charts in all of those categories there in just the last 60 seconds or so. We can sometimes become numb to the performances that he puts up, but especially for a guy who hits as powerful as he can, I mean, to be able to steal bases at the rate that he does, not even – having a few here and there, but just coming out every single game and being a threat, that's something that not every ball club has the luxury of having, especially in the top of your lineup. It's the 21st stolen base of the season for Neves. It's double number five. It's RBI number 37. A little pickoff attempt to third base there from Pollard. I think that was one that was probably called from the dugout. It's probably a verbal call, or maybe it could be a signal from the catcher, but they try to get Neves napping over there, which is not something you see a lot, a little pick to third, but I like it. Here's a ground ball from Eric Hyatt that will score Avery Neves. Oh, and it got away from the first baseman. That's a E3 or an E6 there, but it's a runner driven in for Eric Hyatt. He is aboard with one out, and it's a fast start here for Lynchburg as they lead 2-0. Neves has got another run scored. There's, there's a category he is the all-time leader in, Evan, run scored. So add another one to the tally for Avery Neves. And Lynchburg looking to add more with Sean Pokorok, the catcher, batting fifth. And to be able to score runs, have to get on the base pads, something Neves has become accustomed to at this point. I believe our official score has given that a single for Eric Hyatt. Error. On the shortstop or the third ba or the first baseman? That's the only question at this point. It's going on the shortstop there. That was Jake DeCunto that seemed to get to it nicely, hung back a little bit. Maybe he didn't get the full picture of how fast Eric Hyatt was getting down the line potentially. Swing and a miss there from the catcher, Sean Pokorok. It's now a 2-1 count, one gone. Lynchburg leads 2-0. Pokorok. So far in the season, 455 on base percentage. That's something that even at 24 at bats, you get on base almost half the times that you're up to the plate. That's a chance to make something special. You know, the Hornets, something that interesting makes an interesting point. You think about that top of the first with Jorman getting in a little bit of trouble, and the Hornets come out and put two on the tally now. So it's these types of situations that can go back and forth that Lynchburg has really capitalized on all season. I agree. They, they seem to master those momentum swings. And I think back to the first inning yesterday against Randolph-Macon, as we'll hold for this delivery here, swung through and held on by Rosenboro. So that is a strikeout, and it is out number two. But think back to the Lynchburg win yesterday. Randolph-Macon gets a solo homer in the top of the first. Feels like they've got some momentum. Their dugout's feeling good. And then Lynchburg answers with three in the bottom of the first. And similar here, not that William Peace scored and not that it was a perfect inning from Lynchburg, but maybe the Pacers feel like, okay, we can beat these guys. We got a couple runs on. They threw the ball around one time. And then all of a sudden, Lynchburg kind of snatches that idea from you right away as they put up two in their half of the first inning. So I think it's a great, it's a great thing you hit on there, Evan. And Lynchburg seems to have a knack for just – I don't know that you can intentionally take the momentum from somebody. I think it's a byproduct of what you've done. But Lynchburg, they really seem to seize the opportunities and, 
and and get that momentum back pretty quickly if if they ever even lose it here at Fox Field. I don't I don't know that they've ever really lost any momentum here at home. This season it certainly feels like it has lingered around regardless of who is taking the field in the visitors dugout. It's teams like William Peace too that just really elevates your performance because to have a team come in hitting as well as they have statistically and a lot of those stats, you look at RBIs, hits. This is a Pacers squad that has out-hit Lynchburg, if you want to say it that way. But that makes this Lynchburg pitching staff want it just a little bit more. Gavin Collins is the hitter right now for the Hornets. 1-2 count, working against Pollard, who's had a long inning to start. Collins will foul that one away. William Peace's offensive numbers, to your point, are, are pretty gaudy if you look at the tail of the tape there. They're ahead of Lynchburg in a lot of statistical categories. Lynchburg's pitching staff statistically is just incredible, one of the best in the nation. And then throw out the statistics. They pass the eye test, too, as far as Lynchburg's arms that they use. Here's another 1-2 delivery coming up. Collins will hit this one. Could be a tough play. Third baseman on the move. Good snap throw over to first, and the inning is over. One left on for Lynchburg. They get one hit, a double from Avery Neves. Two runs on the board, and there was one William Peace error. We're through one here at Fox Field. Coming back in just a second on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. Avery Neves gets an RBI double in the first inning. How about this? How about this replay? How about the production here, Evan? This is top tier. Again, the center fielder got to it nicely and put the throw on target, but Avery Neves just too much speed out of the batter's box, and it's a hustle double for number 30. And it was the first run of the ball game. And Lynchburg leading 2-0. Neves came around to score. He's just doing it all again. He'll make a defensive play here in this inning, I'm sure, Evan. Oh, absolutely. The ball chooses him almost <laughs> out in left field. I like it. Well, and you know, the game the game knows, though. The game knows. That's something Lucas Jones, our wonderful head coach here at Lynchburg, talks about. The game knows when you've been putting the work in and when you're doing things the right way. And in basketball, you say ball don't lie. Yeah, it's the same concept. You know, if you, if you do things the way you're supposed to, you end up getting good things that come to you. Now, it's not always that black and white and that easy. But, uh, you know, it does seem to work out. And for a guy like Avery Neves, it's been working out his entire career. Mm, there's a good spot from Josh Jorman. It was a 1-2 pitch that just barely missed the outer edge of the plate. 2-2 two -two on Sean Roseboro, the catcher for William Peace. Here comes an inside target from Pokerock. Got it there, but missed downstairs, and now the count is full. So William Peace lineup, it just seems like everyone can really get on base, even if their batting average is under 300, which obviously for baseball, that's more of an average stat. But so many of the Pacers have averages over 300. Looking in just this lineup today, I believe it's four. And then we know that Brett Kemp is batting over 400, something that you just don't see every day. Well, I think it's a lineup that has the Lynchburg coaching staff's full attention they they obviously, I think, uh, Jorman gave him the free pass there. So it's the second walk of the ball game for Josh Jorman. Uh, just continuing the thought, this this game is not an afterthought for Lynchburg. They, they know how good this William Peace offense is. 
and they know how tough it's going to be to come off of a big emotional high victory yesterday. Uh, we had a great crowd yesterday. Today, a little lighter, although some students have made their way down. But that's, that was just a massive win yesterday. As here comes a massive swing. This ball pounded into the corner by Adam Joseph, and Avery Neves did get there quickly to cut that off and maintain it as a single instead of potentially a double. But Lynchburg, as a coach, you're worried about a letdown today because you, you used up a lot of mental, a lot of emotional energy yesterday and some fin physical energy too as well. But I, I think the emotional and the mental piece is more what you're worried about as a coach. And guess what? The Pacers have got two on with nobody out, so they're in business here in the top of the second. It's been heavy traffic early on. We know that Dorman has seen a little bit of it all. He has a chance wow. for two, and he's going to get it. How about that, Kyle? <laughs> well, another thing that good teams do, they take advantage of those opportunities, and a lofted bunt there by Cam Barefoot, the left fielder, was in the catching zone for Josh Jorman. He pounced off the mound, makes the grab. Here it is, yeah. Barefoot just bunted the bottom half of that ball instead of the top half. It went up. Jorman caught it through a strike to second base. It's two outs, and all of a sudden, we felt like William Peace had their best chance to score, and that got erased. It's now two outs. Still a runner on first. The threat is not completely over. It's the nine-hole hitter, Nick Tyler, the center fielder, in the box now. I'm impressed with how quickly Dorman was able to get off the mound. Obviously, you pop up a bunt, that's going to signal the reflex to make sure you get a glove on it, but to be able to turn back to second, it seemed like the entire Lynchburg dugout had his attention. And now, two outs and a chance to get out of the inning. Seems like that has uh, put some wind in his sails. It's now an 0-2 count. Josh Jorman on Nick Tyler. Jormand is a first baseman and a great hitter, great athlete. I mean, you see that. So that helps when you have those athletes on the mound. 0-2 delivery. Jorman got it. Not sure it was exactly where he wanted it, but it didn't matter. It froze Nick Tyler, and the inning is done. It started great for William Peace, but it did not end that way. They get one hit. They leave one on, no Lynchburg errors. Hornets get a double play in there to maintain the shutout for the moment. 2-0, Lynchburg going to the bottom of the second. Great moments are born from great opportunity. That's what you have here tonight. That's what you've earned here tonight. This is your time. Now go out there and take it. Riley O'Donovan, the designated hitter, leads off for Lynchburg. In the bottom of the second, Hornets already with a 2-0 lead over William Peace, Kyle Haney, and Evan Gates. Hanging out with you baseball fans on a Thursday afternoon. It's warm out there, Evan. 90 degrees is the projected high today. But it's, it's, not, that, it's not that July and August major humidity, so it doesn't feel terrible out there right now, at least in my opinion. Watch out. Ball travels further in the warm weather. Did Riley O'Donovan get enough of this one? He'll bang it off the wall. You get a fake throw from the left fielder, which was pretty crafty, and then the center fielder picks it up. But Riley rocking one to the left center gap off the wall. That is double number eight of the season for Mr. O'Donovan, and it's a leadoff double for the Hornets. He liked the pitch he got, and he rocked it out into the gap, and I think this is a Hornet squad that is continuing to put runners on early in the innings. Strong swing from Riley O'Donovan. Center fielder and left fielder going after it. 
And one hop off the wall. Ben Jones is the eight hole hitter today. Second baseman takes strike one. So this is back to baseball being so interesting and so unique every game. Yesterday for Lynchburg, it was 12 singles, only singles. And now they've got two hits and they're both doubles. They're both extra base hits. So there you go. I know Coach Lucas Jones has, you know, wanted more extra base hits. Uh, I don't think he wants to sacrifice contact or anything. He doesn't want guys swinging out of their shoes, going crazy in there. But he would like to see his team get a few more balls elevated. And, you know, with Avery Neves, his was more of the hustle double variety, but definitely in that left center gap, much like Riley O'Donovan's. Ben Jones takes ball number two, two one count with nobody out. Lynchburg got five doubles in that second game against Averett this weekend, and I think the direction is certainly shaping up for Lucas Jones. Singles aren't necessarily a bad thing, but it's when you get into the UNAC tournament, teams that will really limit that contact and maybe singles become ground outs or just not the contact that you prefer. So to be able to get ones into the gap confidently is something the Hornets would like to see. Lucas Jones jokingly after the game called it death by a thousand cuts. And there is something to be said, yeah, for being able to wear a team down and string a bunch of singles together. But the extra base hits do have their place in the game, don't they, Evan? I mean, just think about it. You can, you can use two doubles and score a run. With an extra base hit, you only need two swings to score a run. Or with a home run, you, you, you get a run on one swing of the bat, right? With singles, you probably need three. You need three singles in an inning to score a run. And you think back to that first inning for Lynchburg, five singles, but they only scored three runs. So there's the math right there. Now, you obviously, you can get your extra bases in there and advance on pass balls. All those things matter, too. And Lynchburg's offense does all those things. Ben Jones has got a 3-1 count to maybe try to get something airborne. Instead, he'll look at ball four, and there you go. There's another part of the offensive equation just as we speak, a walk or a hit by pitch also offering some value as well. Here's Carson Atkins. He can get the ball elevated. Carson Atkins on the season has nine doubles and five home runs. So he definitely fits the bill as far as extra base hitters. As you just mentioned, to have someone who is tied for the home run lead on the team in the nine hole, that's pretty dangerous. Especially when you're getting on base at a solid rate, 416 on base percentage, batting 330. Yeah. Leads the team with seven doubles as well. So you talk about extra base hits. This is a guy who can go out there and perform. Yeah, it's been a great season for Carson Atkins. It's been a great career for him as well, a grad student from Charlottesville. Here's a back pick attempt. Ben Jones sliding in safely. Good sharp throw from the catcher, Roseboro. But Jones was up to the challenge there. Nobody away. It's an 0-1 count on Carson Atkins. Atkins had that major hot streak. where He was up around 390 for a bit. The average dropped back down. He'll show bunt there. We know that's part of his offensive arsenal as well. Did not like the call, but it's a 1-2 count. Doesn't mean the bunt is off with two strikes, but I wonder if Coach Jones might be more inclined to let Atkins swing away now. Riley O'Donovan leading off at second. Atkins does stay alive a bit out front of the off-speed pitch but able to yank it down the line foul. I think with no outs, to your point, certainly a situation where you let him swing away. Atkins seems like one of those guys where even if, and we said it about Garcia, even if it's not necessarily a productive at bat, you're still getting at that pitch count, but that will be strike three. Breaking ball in the dirt got Atkins there in the top of the order returns with a guy you just briefly mentioned, Brandon Garcia. Walked in his first plate appearance, so no official at bats yet for Brandon Garcia. And there's a great close angle look at the catcher. Roseboro blocking that breaking ball as it came in, and you could get a feel for how far out in front Carson Atkins was on that. Second strikeout of the game for Aubrey Pollard. Garcia will show the bunt, get the infield moving around a little bit. Just ball one there. Infield, third baseman's even with the bag. First baseman playing behind the runner at first and in the middle at double play depth. 
Shortstop trying to keep Riley O'Donovan close. They'll spin and throw to second. 1-0 count with one out in the bottom of the second inning. Lynchburg will be in action this weekend, Evan. I think they moved that Saturday game to Sunday, though, in anticipation of some bad weather, really not just in Winchester, where Shenandoah plays, but kind of all over the eastern seaboard. Garcia will not get a lot of this, but places it perfectly in front of the right fielder. Riley O'Donovan gets the stop sign at third base. Ball is cut, and now bases are loaded with one out for Logan Webster. Brandon Garcia continues the hitting streak. Now it's 15 in a row for Brandon Garcia. 15 games in a row he has hit safely. That goes back to March 7th. He missed some games in there. He was out from uh, March 14th to the 26th. So he did miss some time, but statistically, it's a 15-game hitting streak now for Brandon Garcia. I like the decision to stop O'Donovan at third because it brings up Logan Webster, who has continued to step up in the big moments. Garcia's going to get back to first. A little bit of an awkward play there going back. No slide. First baseman was not anchored to the bag. Catcher threw it to him where he was at, and yet Garcia was able to not even really beat the throw but get around the first baseman and then the tag, and it was a little awkward as he tried to apply the brakes. Logan Webster, check swing, line drive. One hop through the infield, one run is in. Fumbled briefly in right field, but Ben Jones holding it third, and the bases are loaded for Avery Neves. Lynchburg. Extending the lead, 3-0 Hornets on top with more damage makers stepping into the box right now. Offense in every form for the Hornets. See a double to lead off the inning, a walk, and then you get back-to-back -back singles. It has this Hornet squad working station to station. That's where that extra base hit becomes so crucial. When you can set the table and really have a situation like this for Avery Neves, where you have three runners on. 15th runner driven in this season for Logan Webster. Neves will take strike one. Good hard fastball in the outer third of the plate there for Pollard. That's a good start, but I'm sure he knows how good Avery Neves is. Even if you don't have the detailed scouting report, you have some idea about the damage this guy can do. So you want to keep the ball down. Don't, don't give him something he can sink his teeth into. Avery Neves already has... A double today, even if you didn't know anything about him, you remember his first at bat, and you're thinking, yeah, let's let's not throw it there again. 1-1 one, one count now for Neves. As he studies Pollard coming set, bases are loaded. Fastball up and out for ball two. Even when Neves steps up to the plate, I mean, I think that really says enough, just the strength that this guy has, and especially when he takes a swing at one, he's not trying to just make a little contact. Let's to put one out. Pollard deals. Neves wanted to get that one out, but missed it. Just got jammed and under it. Infield fly rule, and the ball is caught at third for out number two. So Neves just misses one, and now it's on Eric Hyatt to try to plate another run or two for Lynchburg. Hornets already leading 3-0. Eric Hyatt got on via the error from the shortstop in his first at bat. That's a huge out if you're Pollard as well. Going to punch out or a pop up in that situation, keep the runners at their respective bases. Now you got two outs. Lynchburg has really, in these last few games, continued to capitalize with runners on base. Obviously, you don't want to have too many left on, but early in the season, that was a bit of the discussion as maybe those hits weren't lining up exactly with what the final score was saying. Hyatt swings on that high hop to the third baseman. Garcia was hustling, nearly beat him to third with the feet first slide, but it is out number three. So Hornets do score. They leave three on. It featured three hits in the inning. No William Peace errors. And the 3-0 lead will take us to the top of the third inning here at Fox Field in Lynchburg.
Josh Jorman getting set to start the third inning for the Lynchburg Hornets. This is start number four this season, and I, I call them the wild card. Lynchburg's got four guys I think you could call aces. They, they could just all – we could get a good graphic design thing where you get Brandon Pond and Zach Potts and Nick Matfield and then Wes Arrington. They could hold up the ace card, and then obviously Jack Batchmore is going to hold up the jack. But then Josh Jorman, I, I picture him holding up the joker, the wild card, uh, because we didn't know what to expect from him. And he does give you that kind of funky delivery. It's hard to pick up. You and I were just sitting here chatting during the timeout. It's hard to tell what pitch he's throwing sometimes. And if we can't tell, then that probably means the batters have a hard time tell, telling also. Absolutely. And we've also mentioned earlier in the season, not having as many appearances, you're not really going to have any footage to go back and look at because Jormand has faced some very different lineups. He's had some very different situations to come into, but every single one, obviously, it's proved fruitful for the Hornets. I think it is hard to identify as a hitter. Watch how Jorman, and you're going to be able to see it here, he turns his back to the hitter. The hitter can almost see that full number as he's twisting in at you, and he's got that pump with the glove and the arms to go along with the leg kick. I think it's a little deceptive, and then when you can throw some different pitches off of that, makes it very difficult. Brett Kemp maybe not finding it so difficult. He's one for one and now has drawn a walk on first base. Kemp got picked off last time he was on, so I'm sure he's going to be stationed a bit closer to the bag, you would assume anyway. 1-0 count as Josh Jorman misses there. So Jorman kind of losing the zone a little bit, just as we were talking about how effective he is. You still have to throw strikes. Doesn't matter how good your stuff is. you got to come after hitters. Here's a ground ball that will get past Brandon Garcia into left field. So it's a walk and a single to begin the third inning for Josh Jorman. And he'll have to pitch with runners on base and in scoring position again. First two batters who have stepped up to the plate each inning so far for William Peace have been able to reach. Jorman still posting a big zero up in the run column, so we'll see if he can hold him here. He's going to have to do so against Patrick Rogan. Leads the team with 15 doubles as well, so he is – Apt to have some loud contact. It's going to be a mound visit from Sean Pokerock, the catcher today. And you do have a little bit of activity now in the Lynchburg bullpen, so we'll keep an eye on that. Interesting numbers for Jorman. Uh, in all three of his previous starts, Evan, he has surrendered six hits. It was two earned runs in his first start against Greensboro, one earned run against Christopher Newport. That was the game we were raving about, a quality start against a ranked team, the captains. And then he gave up three earned runs on April 12th against Pfeiffer. We know the Falcons have a good offense. We were impressed with them. It's been pretty solid numbers for Josh Jorman all the way around. And he's been solid today, but he'll have to pitch out of some danger again here in the top of the third inning. This is a good situation for this Lynchburg defense because you want reps and Pressure situations, not just having three up, three down. We know a lot of the times you see a pitcher like Batchmore, who's a high strikeout guy, come in, and then maybe you don't have as much traffic around the base pad. So it's about staying disciplined and really making sure that you can hold every runner when it's possible. Does put a bit more pressure on your defense when they have to make a few more plays. Now Lynchburg's defense, I think, has been rock solid all season. But, yeah, high strikeout guy like Jack Batchmore. Not, not that the defense can just take the rest of the game off, but you know Batch is going to get his share of Ks and punch outs, and you got to say the same thing with all those starters that we mentioned as well. There's a lot of high strikeout guys on this Lynchburg staff. A lot of great options out of the bullpen. We'll see which ones Lynchburg goes to today. Or who knows, maybe Josh Jorman can just carry this thing the whole way. We'll see. 2-1 count right now for Jorman. Takes a second look at the runner. Oops, that got under Sean Pokorok's glove. Tried to field it off the wall and see if the runners were late, but there's no play at third or second. Both guys advanced 90 feet. Now it's two in scoring position for William Peace with a 3-1 count. Pat Rogan, the right fielder, flew out to right in his first at bat. But a chance to really do something here for the Pacers. Jorman. Kicks and fires. That one misses inside. It was competitive. It was close. But it's a walk, and it's 
Second one of the inning for Jorman, fourth of the game. Associate head coach Travis Beasley will take a trip out to the mound and we can mention how underappreciated I think Coach Beasley is and what he does. Uh, Michael Solbach, another guy that works with the pitchers here at Lynchburg, they just do such a wonderful job with all these guys, Evan. I mean, we've been naming pitchers all inning long, and we could continue to those bullpen guys. How about Travis Shoemate and Angel Collazo coming in and doing a great job yesterday in the win? It was one batter apiece for those guys, but it was two really good hitters. Uh, Shoemate got Iannuzzi out, who had homered previously. He was the two-hole man, and then Collazo gets the three-hole hitter. So that speaks to the level of confidence that the coaching staff has in those two guys, and I would extend that to pretty much the entire bullpen. I mean, you have some guys that are going to get a brighter spotlight or a longer look than others, but I think this coaching staff really likes what they've got pitching-wise this season, and the numbers would back that up as well. Well, there's a whole other dimension, too, to being a reliever coming out of the bullpen or even – having some appearances as a starter. And I think what the coaches do so well is not only making those decisions, but instilling trust in the pitchers who are going out at the times that they do and having good matchups. And Jormand is certainly going to need some of that confidence here with the bases loaded. Yeah, let's turn our full attention back to this at bat. It is bases loaded. Nobody out for Jake DeCunto, the shortstop for William Peace. He's got a real opportunity here. Jorman across with strike one, breaking ball. Ooh, this one kicks away from Pokorok. Runner will go, runner will score. Brett Kemp is in for the first run of the game for the Pacers. You see defense in the spotlight right there. I think it was pretty good textbook blocking position from Sean Pokorok. We're going to get to take another look at it, I think. But the ball kicks away to the visitor's side dugout. Yeah, here we go. Let's check it. Pokorok is there, but the ball lands out in front of the plate and then hits him up high on the right shoulder, the throwing side shoulder. That one's tough as a catcher. As Jorman will spin, and they're going to call a balk. There was nobody at second, and Jorman made what we'll call a half-hearted pickoff attempt there. So that is a balk, and the run will score. The second run will score. Hunter Ward comes across. Pat Rogan, who drew the walk, moves up 90 feet to second. So now all of a sudden we got ourselves a ball game again, Evan. 3-2, Lynchburg still leads. Tying run is on second with nobody out. DeCunto swings on that, barrels it up. It's in the left center gap. Atkins won't get there. Neves was in the neighborhood. Carson Atkins will pick it up and fire it in to the relay man, Brandon Garcia. But that's an RBI double for Jake DeCunto, and the game is tied at three. Talk about that bat that we're going to look back on later in this game and see the impact as DeCunto not only gets one into the gap, but with the balk, we've got a tie ball game just like that as the Pacers have put a three in the run column here in this third inning. Fifth hit of the game for William Peace. They've taken four walks. They've had a couple base runners erased. There was a double play in there where they tried to bunt, popped it up. Here's a bunt attempt again from Jacob Norris that he'll pull back. Josh Jorman picked off. Brett Kemp was the leadoff man to begin the game. So William Peace is getting their share of base runners on Lynchburg right now. 3-3 ball game. We thought maybe high scoring affair. Seen a little bit of everything this inning with that, with that balk. And here it is. When the pitcher makes a pickoff move, it has to be to an occupied base. You can't try to pick off to an empty base, and that's exactly what Josh Jorman did. It's one of those little quirks in the rules as this bunt attempt will hit a foot in front of the line fair, but then spin foul for strike two. One, two, the count with nobody out on Jacob Norris. And I don't know, Evan, I don't know how much you chalk that up to focus or what. I mean, Josh Jorman's always focused. I don't, I don't think that's what it is. I think it's just... Uh, one of those baseball things, occasionally you make kind of a weird mistake that uh, doesn't happen very often, but it hurts in this case with the balk. Well, no one's going to be perfect out there on the mound, but I think especially with how many batters have reached for William Peace, it can be difficult. As a difficult play, throw to first will be in time for out number one. Runner moves up 90 feet to third. That was Ben Jones that came on to make the running play on the move. And we have seen 
all today for Josh Jorman. He will exit in a tie ball game, and we'll figure out who our next arm is. It is William Peace and Lynchburg. William Peace comes into the game at 16 and 16. Lynchburg 27 and four. They've won seven in a row. Hornets have won 14 out of their last 15, Evan. So the ball club is really rolling. It's been an outstanding season. And they want to keep it going here today, but obviously getting a stiff test against William Peace. I think William Peace was going to be a tough test, even if Lynchburg was off yesterday. But you combine the big emotional victory yesterday over Randolph-Macon. And I think we just had, we had to assume this was going to be a pretty good ball game, don't you think? Well, at this point of the season, there are no gimmies in it. We know that having a 3-3 ball game in this third inning isn't necessarily something that we didn't expect. And two clubs that have posted lots of runs throughout the season. We're going to go back to that previous play that we saw in the last inning. One of the balks looked back at second, but no one was on the bag. That caused one of the runners to score now a tie ball game. It's Mason McDowell who comes in for Lynchburg, number 13. 675 ERA. This will be appearance number eight, and it will come in relief. Six and two thirds innings so far, and really all season long, this bullpen has been capable of eating innings and doing it efficiently. So I have to see what McDowell can bring to the table. Book on McDowell is a hard throwing right hander. He's got a good breaking ball to go with the fastball. You're getting a nice shot at him right now, and his mechanics he really gets down the slope pretty quick Evan he's one of those guys that I think he's got that short compact throwing motion he's an infielder we've seen him start games at shortstop uh, he doesn't have the shortest arm action on the ball club but it's pretty quick he's got that kind of buggy whip that rock and fire action and it really is something to feel great about if you're a Lynchburg fan because Mason McDowell is just a freshman and it's been a lot of fun watching him pitch so far He'll be tested in this one with a runner on third, one out. Lynchburg looks like they're going to have the defense sort of halfway in, although as I say that, the middle starts backing up a little bit. First baseman Eric Hyatt is even with the bag. Gavin Collins, the third baseman, playing slightly behind, so maybe a hard shot to Collins. He might have a play at home. It looks like the middle would have to throw across to first base on a ground ball. Four walks so far in this ball game for the Pacers, plus the balk that scored the runner, and I think that's really just a testament to the patience that they have at the plate. We knew that they would come in and have discipline, a team that has national, nationally ranked numbers in the walks column. So for the Pacers, I think you just have to continue doing what you've done, getting the pitches you like. 0-2 count here for McDowell. I think he tried the breaking ball again, and that one Finally fended off by the catcher, Sean Rosenborough. Turn on one early there inside and get that pull action. Like you mentioned, Collins might have a throw home in an ideal scenario, be able to keep this game tied. McDowell set just below the chin, looks at the runner once, fires another twister there that really hit the target nicely, but it was off the plate. And now it's a one-two count. I think the location was probably just where Lynchburg wanted it. Let's see how they pitch off of that. One, two now. Looks like the same spot. Fastball this time, and it is on target. Strikeout for Mason McDowell. Early indications are good there. There's two away, and it's Adam Joseph, the second baseman, already one for one in this game, but it'll be the first at bat against the hard-throwing freshman, Mason McDowell. Huge out there to be able to come in with a chance now to get out of the inning. Lynchburg in this game, we know that the doubleheader being pushed back to Sunday will help a little bit, but you wonder who will be utilized out of the bullpen, especially when we have a busy part of the schedule coming up. It's such a weird balance for coaches because you want to save your bullpen, but you also want to get your bullpen some work. You, you want to have some guys stay current and stay regular. You don't want guys going three and four weeks without throwing. Hold that thought, 0-2 pitch coming up with two strikes. McDowell on the corner, he thought he hit it. 
but it is off the plate for ball one. One, two count, two away. So much fun watching McDowell pitch. I mean, it's kind of an old school delivery action here. Let's get another look at it. One, two, here it comes. Breaking ball, got him. Two strikeouts to get Lynchburg out of the inning. We are tied though, knotted at three through two and a half here at Fox Field. Hornets coming back to bat in the bottom of the third next. Every great college has a great city. For Lynchburg, we are near urban areas with lots of restaurants, shopping, and events. Plus, we are one of the top schools in the area. Come see for yourself. Sean Pokerock will take ball one to begin the bottom of the third inning for Lynchburg. We're now tied up at three as William Peace scores two on two hits, left one runner on. Mason McDowell came out of the bullpen in relief of Josh Jorman and struck out two hitters. Now we can start debating whether Mason McDowell's coming back out for more, Evan, or if that's just going to be it and we'll see a new face for the Hornets, but we'll wait and see. Sean Pokorak's got a 3-0 count to work with here. It's the starter, Aubrey Pollard, still out there working for the Pacers. Well, I think if you're Lynchburg, you'd like to make it a long bottom of the third, try to stir up some trouble. This is a Hornets squad that has really found success in every inning, but especially those middle innings. They've had some chances to really put up numbers and I don't think that they're ever going to feel pressured in a game like this, but you like to be able to find success at any stage of the game. It makes a lot of sense as Pokorok puts a charge into this one. Left fielder going back, looks up. It will not stay in the yard. Timber as Sean Pokorok hits it into the trees. There's the answer from Lynchburg. That momentum swing again, Evan. Hornets surrender two in the top of the third. They get a leadoff jack from Sean Pokerock. There's the response. There's the momentum right there that the Hornets need. First of the season for Sean Pokerock as he leaves the yard in left field. You talk about confidence and you talk about a big inning. Pokerock has had a chance to do both, and it's a very solid start. Turned on it and never looked back. That one was pulled into left. Touched on it earlier at Fox Field. You don't see many homers, but when you do, sometimes they can be pretty emphatic. And it's the third extra base hit for Lynchburg. Puts them up 4-3. Gavin Collins, another man with elite power. He has left the yard here at Fox Field. 0-2 count, hitting against Pollard. Collins will fight that one off. Got it airborne. Could be a tough play, but the center fielder will get under it. That's Nick Tyler who makes the grab for out number one. Good bounce back there from Pollard. You always like to see that from a pitcher. Giving up that solo home run rattles you. That's never fun, but Pollard came back and went right after Gavin Collins. So tip of the cap there. And here comes another guy that can also hit the long ball and play wall ball. He's already done it once today. Riley O'Donovan hit that double in the gap that bounced off the James C. Fox Field logo out there in left center. 
For Pollard, it's a similar situation to what we saw with Brandon Pond yesterday. You give up a solo shot, obviously it's a lot better than having runners on the bases. And maybe a little bit easier mentally just to come back and stay in a rhythm. Five hits for Lynchburg as a team. Two doubles, a homer, and two singles is the breakdown on that right now. Riley O'Donovan will take strike one. It's a 2-1 count for O'Donovan. Second at bat against Pollard. O'Donovan gets that one off the end of the bat, but it drops in for a base hit, so he is two for two. Sixth hit of the ball game now. And Lynchburg back in business with one out, and here comes Benny Bombs, Ben Jones. Speaking of people that can clear the deck and leave the yard. Well, Kyle, I'd like to know the conversations going on in this Lynchburg dugout as well because we've seen lots of contact in this half of the inning and maybe after getting a hit or even just having something loud, you go back and make sure that your buddy can follow it up. Hitting is very contagious. I'm a firm believer in that. O'Donovan will hold as that ball hit the mitt of Roseboro and kicked away, but not far enough for Riley O'Donovan to advance. Yeah, hitting is, is contagious and, and Maybe it is that shared information, something you see about the guy, or maybe it's not even that concrete or, or definable. Maybe it's just it rubs off on people. But it seems to happen that way so much. It happens that way with Lynchburg. I think part of the reason why they do so much damage in those middle innings, you've gotten maybe a second at bat on the pitcher. That helps on the starting pitcher. He might be starting to tire a little bit in four, five, and six, maybe. The opposition hasn't made the move to the bullpen just yet. So I think, again, it makes a lot of sense to me that Lynchburg has those offensive explosions in the middle part of the game and later parts of the game. Not that they can't do it early on, but you tend to see it more, like you pointed out, in the middle innings. Ben Jones gets under this, lifts it down the left field line. It will be foul and out of play. Sets up a 1-2 count for Jones, one out. Sunny day here at Foxfield. Crowd is growing, not quite the level of attendance that we had yesterday for the Randolph making game, but the crowd is growing out there. And braving the heat as well. Touched on it earlier, it might be an interesting decision to wear the black uniforms today when it feels like 90 degrees out there. I think those things breathe a little bit better than we're than we realize. But yeah, no, it is warm out there. Pack the sunscreen too, for sure. You know it. We need some LHSN issued sunscreen. We were on that yesterday because so many of our, our, our staff, our production team, camera operators, they're out there in the sun. So it makes sense. We'll get a little logo on there. It'll be fun. Ben Jones will foul another one off. What about my graphic design idea with the, with the four aces for Lynchburg? You oh, know? I like it. Wouldn't that be cool? I feel like it's an idea that just continues growing. As like every single it. game, there's something new from this pitching yeah, staff. That's true. That's true. They give us so much to talk about. You're right. You're right. And the home crowd has been treated to some great baseball at Fox, undefeated. So that's obviously great baseball. Ben Jones working with a 2-2 count. One out. Jones will watch that little leaking, breaking ball drift away. Jones walked in his first plate appearance. We'll see if he can do something like that here. Ben Jones wants to hit. Very patient, but I know he gets frustrated sometimes taking all the walks. I feel like Avery Neves has got to be the same way as well, right? Full count pitch. Oh, strike three. Ben Jones thought he had his second walk of the ball game. Instead, it's a backwards K for Aubrey Pollard, and there's two outs in the inning now. Sometimes you maybe try to sell it to the umpire a little bit, but in that case... Ben Jones unable to get one, and Carson Atkins stepping in with two outs. Up and down this lineup, batters who are able to contribute. As you saw there with Jones, it's a situation where we've seen him all around the lineup, and I think it's a situation that you have to tune your hitting to where you're at, especially if you're someone who's batting right behind Avery Neves, getting a little bit more opportunities. The lineup construction is something that baseball minds have been talking about for 150 plus years. How do you set up that lineup? There's some new school ways and some old school ways. I think Coach Lucas Jones has got a great combination of both. Carson Atkins will foul that one to the backstop. 0-2 count with two outs on a guy who has hit in this nine hole spot every game this season. Evan 
Very rare to have anybody for Lynchburg be in the same spot every game, but Carson Atkins qualifies there, and he started every game as well. And with the production he's had, you love the chance you get to set the table as he'll watch that one in the dirt. I think that's that's one of the new school concepts that the the metrics have told us here in the last 20 years is how important that nine-hole spot is to set up the guys you've got at the top of the order. One-two count for Atkins. Two away. Fastball outside. Might have been an intentional called pick to try to get Riley O'Donovan there at first, but he's back in time. Sean Roseboro not shy about turning it loose, picking as a catcher. That's fun to watch. 2-2 two -two count now. It's the old deuces wild situation on the scoreboard with number 12, Carson Atkins. Fast ball, just missed. And now the count is full. O'Donovan will be able to take off on this pitch. And as you said, they're continuing to throw it to first after the pitch. And I think it's interesting because maybe you wait a little while and in the eighth and ninth inning, even if you haven't been able to get one yet, you can have a big pick off. Here's the full count delivery, breaking ball in the dirt. Atkins lays off, and it's a two-out walk by the nine-hole man, Carson Atkins. Lead off. Hitting here for the third time in the ball game. Brandon Garcia's third plate appearance. He's just one for one because there was a walk in there, Evan. But how outstanding is that? And that really bodes well for Lynchburg as a team. When your leadoff man has gotten three trips into the batter's box in three innings, Pretty outstanding stuff. Just four runs on the board, but that tells you what Lynchburg has done as far as turning the lineup over goes. I think Pollard's going to regret that walk a little bit if Garcia can get the bat on one. We've seen it all season long, both offensively and defensively. Seems like when Garcia's in the lineup, he makes good things happen. Left-handed hitting freshman from Durham, North Carolina. Thought about asking for time, or maybe didn't, wasn't granted time, so he'll hit anyway with a no-one count, two outs. Takes the fastball upstairs. Now it's even at one and one. Riley O'Donovan leads off at second. Carson Atkins, good speed at first. Outfield regular depth for William Peace. Infield pretty much straight up, with the exception of the shortstop, kind of keeping Riley O'Donovan close at second. One-one, Pollard holds, kicks. Spins the breaking ball in there for a strike. That was one of his better ones. That had good action on it right there. I wonder if he'll go back to it. Sometimes when you get great feel on that breaking ball, Evan, you want to throw it again, try to get the carbon copy effect going here. Let's find out. Pollard is set and ready to go. One-two count on Brandon Garcia. Instead, it's a fastball, outer half, and he got him looking. Inning over. Lynchburg does score one solo homer from Sean Pokerock. They leave two on, two hits total. No William Peace errors, and the Hornets take the lead back four to three. This is how they got it right here. Big swing from Sean Pokerock. First homer of the season puts the Hornets back up on top. To them, the whole world looks like an opportunity, one to be seized, built upon, and made better for their sport and the people around it. To student athletes, every opportunity is a chance to change what could be and show the world what opportunity can do. Mason McDowell is back out there on the mound for the Hornets. 
They're clinging to a 4-3 lead early in this one here at Fox Field as we take you to the top of the fourth. Evan Gates, Kyle Haney right here on LHSN. The Pacers, a squad that throughout this season, regardless of their record sitting at 516 and 16, has been capable of really putting together some solid performances, especially from a batting standpoint. And Cameron Barefoot is going to get things started. Second meeting for these two squads. It was an 11-10 Lynchburg victory back on February 28th. Watch out, hot shot off the bat of Barefoot, but it's out of play foul. Uh, the series history, three and seven all time, William Peace against Lynchburg. So for the Hornets, they've won seven out of 10 against William Peace. Uh, Pacers have actually won here at Fox Field, but that got to go back to 2017 for that, Evan. But interesting sometimes to look at those all-time series records. It's funny when they do that in the big league games, like, you know, the Mets and Yankees. Or, uh, the Mets and Yankees actually make sense because they haven't been playing that long. But, like, Red Sox and Yankees, they've only played, like, a billion baseball games. I don't think Just the all-time. Yeah. I mean, does the all-time series really matter at this point? Is anybody thinking about that? You know, I don't know. Seems it's like every season there's something new, too. So let's look at the history. Maybe you look at a few of those big games, but I'm with you on that as Barefoot is going to earn the walk. Quick point on the William Peace head coach, as you mentioned some of that history, Charlie Long. It's his second season with the Pacers, but he has had a very successful career as a coach. He led NC Wesleyan to a national title in 1999 and 17 USA South championships. So he has been around success, and I think that mentality has certainly helped the Pacers out as he's already – the program leader for wins in a single season by a coach. They had 23 last season in 2022. Charlie Long took over at North Carolina Wesley in 1998. And then that national title the next season. I think that's the second one in history for the battling bishops of North Carolina Wesleyan, who we will see at Fox Field in a couple weeks, actually. But, uh, yeah, it was... 98 to 29 or to 2018, I think, for Charlie Long there at North Carolina Wesleyan, and then took a couple seasons to get refreshed and recharged, and now he's leading the William Peace Pacers, one of the all-time great baseball minds, Charlie Long. He's got a lot of cachet when you talk to other coaches that have been around. They all really respect Coach Long and everything he does. Runner going to second. It's going to be a throw that hops in the grass and unable to get barefoot. He's now 12 for 12 on stolen base attempts this season. He's leading the team in that category. And so now for Nick Tyler at the plate, one, two count, runner in scoring position. Tyler, 294 batting average this season, 24 RBIs, playing in center field today. McDowell delivers. He's going to hang and popped up to the second baseman for out number one. So solid work from Ben Jones to bring that one in. It's going to turn things over to the top of the lineup as Brett Kemp steps in once again, one for one with a walk. And Kyle, we've talked about it all game with a 412 batting average. He's dangerous every time he steps up to the plate. He's definitely won. Your scouting report's probably going to be a little bit more detailed. <laughs> and some of that is just by virtue of he's got so many hits. You've got so many little dots on your spray chart there of where he puts the ball in play. So it's so fascinating when you look at those scouting reports. Each team's different, but Lynchburg's is very good. In fact, Jackson Harding made that great play over his shoulder yesterday, and I said, hey, man, great catch there. That saved a run. And the first thing he said was, yeah, Coach Beasley, he does such a great job with putting us in, in where we need to be in the scouting reports, moving us around. Sometimes pitch by pitch, they'll, they'll move those outfielders around. So he was very, very quick to compliment associate head coach Travis Beasley and the entire staff for putting together those scouting reports and helping make that play for him. You see that at the professional level, but to bring that to college is something that's pretty cool as Barefoot is going to easily move to third. So danger continuing to lurk as Lynchburg has just a one-run lead here in the top of the fourth. I think it's so important, too, with scouting reports because, obviously, 
you're going to see hitters who come in and maybe goes the other way that you're not expecting. But so much of this game is on the stat sheet. And I think especially, as you mentioned, with the work Bees puts, puts in, it's something that you have to take advantage of. McDowell with the pitch. And a nice play by Garcia. And he's going to hold the runner at third. He was moving into center field from shortstop. Made that play look a lot easier than it was. And there's going to be two outs on the board now. Brandon Garcia will allow the Hornets to hold on to a one-run lead. We're going to take another look at it. A yeah, great way to take a hit away right here. Brandon Garcia just floating into shallow center field and then to turn and fire home there. Runner ended up not going, but, it, it, well, it's a good thing for William Peace that he didn't run because that throw was on target and on time by Brandon Garcia. Sometimes we don't understand just how difficult that play is, not just the catch, but being able to turn when your momentum is going the other way. Yeah, body control there, athleticism, and then the reactions as well. All those things come into play. A good shortstop, Evan, just worth their weight in gold. You think about the ground balls, all those plays that you have a lot, but then it's those little floating, looping balls just over the infield. You take a half a dozen of those away in a season, all of a sudden it's a real big impact. Big pitch coming here, 0-2. McDowell is going to get it to pop up. Chance to get out of the inning. Who's got it? Ben Jones has it from second. And just like that, the Hornets will get out of the top of the fourth. So, still a one-run game, but here at Fox Field, we know anything can happen. It's baseball right here on LHSN. Private education is too expensive? Think again. At the University of Lynchburg, you can get a personalized education for the cost of a state school. If you're commuting and you get our top scholarships, you could pay much less. And you get all that without the hassle of giant lecture halls. Our faculty know your name here and do more than just teach. You might even do research together and plan out your next career move. Right back with you on LHSN. New pitcher for the Pacers is going to be Justin Conway. Makes Pollard's line done. Three innings of work as they turn things over to the bullpen. For Conway this season, he will come in in 8-4-4 ERA. This is his 10th appearance. 10 and 2 thirds innings of work. Midweek matchups always interesting to see how the bullpen shape up. We know there are lots of games in a baseball season. The Pacers haven't played since last weekend against Pfeiffer, but Lynchburg coming off of a very strong win against Randolph Bacon yesterday. Top 10 matchup. And the ODAC just continues to shape up to be really exciting as we hit the crucial stages of the season. Three ODAC teams ranked in the top 10 nationally. That is Lynchburg, of course, seventh in the nation right now. Shenandoah and Randolph-Macon. And Lynchburg's getting to play the other two teams ranked in the top 10 in the same week. Victory 4-3 over the Yellow Jackets from Macon yesterday. And then it's the Shenandoah Hornets on the road in Winchester on Sunday now, scheduled for Saturday, but now moved to Sunday. So. Hornets beat the Yellow Jackets yesterday, Evan, and they get to play another Hornets team Sunday. Lynchburg looking for the King of Sting Award. I How think about is that, that? Yeah, yeah, I just came up with that just now. It wasn't pre, that wasn't pre-planned or anything. Well, the wordplay we talked about earlier, the cards, now we have oh, yeah. the Hornets battle. I mean, that's something that only Kyle Haney can do. <laughs> he does it efficiently as well. 
How about the uh, delivery here from the new man, Justin Conway? This is fun to watch, how he throws the baseball. Comes over definitely unique and really doesn't allow the hitter to see the ball for very long before it's coming at him. Something that we've touched on. We know especially with Nick Matfield still injured for the Hornets, but someone who comes out with lots of different arm angles, different pitches, it's something that when you get up to face a guy, you might not see the same pitch twice. Mm. So we see a breaking ball inside. It's going to be a 2-2 count to Logan Webster. He's got that little frisbee slider that so many sidearm guys have. It's interesting the way Conway he comes set almost like he's going to be a true submarine guy. And then he actually almost rises up to a, a bit more of an upright position and brings it in there, true sidearm delivery. Still gets decent velocity on it, too. Yeah. He's got a nice windup. Full count. Webster has so far grounded out and singled. This will be his third at bat. He's going to get one to the second baseman, and it will get passed. So base hit for Webster. That will lead off. The bottom of the fourth, that's going to bring up the All-American Avery Neves. Good Neves stuff. already with the hit. Sorry there, Evan. Good stuff by Logan Webster. Taking what the pitcher gives him, not trying to do too much, shoots it the other direction. It's two singles for Logan Webster, seven hits in the game for the Hornets offense. Continuing to get runners on base. When Neves is capable of driving them in. There's a new stat every single game with Avery Neves, and we focused on so many different things. I want to go back to the base stealing from earlier that we saw. He got around the bases and had to steal to third, and I just, especially when postseason play comes, I think the stolen base is one of those stats that becomes so much more important because if you're having an off day from a batting standpoint, that can be a very, very strong equalizer. And back to those singles like we talked about, you need multiple singles to score a guy. Well, not if he steals second and third. Watch out. Avery Neves bludgeons this ball into center field, but it'll stay in the ballpark, Evan. Tested the warning track. But as you said, it will not leave Fox. And that will bring up Eric Hyatt. Not all outs are created equally, and that one for Neves had a bit of travel to it. It did, it was high and it was far, but not quite far enough. Tough to get one out in center field at Fox. I've seen it done before, but it's rare. You even talk to some of the OG Lynchburg fans that have been watching games here for years. It could probably count on one hand the amount of times people hit a ball out of dead center here at Fox Field. There's a hit batter. Eric Hyatt is on after getting plunked in the left thigh, it looked like. So Webster moves up 90 feet. Hyatt's on first, and that's going to bring up our catcher, Sean Pokorok. Homer in his last at bat was a loud one in the left field. And a chance here to continue adding to the run column. Swings at the first pitch, foul. Out of Dumfries, Virginia. So many different guys that we've seen throughout the season, and this is true for every ball club, but from the Hornets' perspective, we know with the catching duties, Pokorok is capable, as we're going to see a replay of that homer earlier. And he did not miss. Enjoyed the trot around the bases, but as I said, Pokorok, Fiedler, see O'Donovan a few times catching, and that has to help a little bit when you have so many double headers in the season. Love these catchers for Lynchburg. We, we just rave about the pitchers with good reason. They deserve all the high praise. Catching staff here at Lynchburg, really good too. And they're blue collar. They work hard. It's another one. After games, you're down there talking to the coaches, and you got catchers catching the bullpens for guys. Holden Fiedler, he's always in the full gear, even when he's not playing, just to be ready at, at a moment's notice to go warm up a guy in the bullpen or in between innings. and. You just got to love that. I, I just I think those guys just embrace getting beat up and battered a little bit as a catcher, black and blue. They love that. So much more of them meets the eye. That's going to be a pitch outside, and the bases 
are loaded for Gavin Collins. Lots of walks in this ball game for both sides. But Collins, who is 0 for 2, isn't looking for a walk. I think he would like to put one into the outfield. Yeah, game plan's pretty simple here for Gavin Collins. Double homer sack fly, something elevated. Pitch down the middle for a strike. Collins, graduate of Centerville High School. 324 on base percentage in 30 games. Seen him quite a bit throughout the season. The conversation continues to linger, just wondering what Lucas Jones will have in store for us as the ODAC tournament approaches, trying to solidify a lineup. You're never quite sure until that day is here. 1-1 one, one count to Collins. Grounder and a chance for two as Collins is going to get down the line and the throw will beat him. So once again, the Hornets have left the bases loaded. It's still a 4-3 ball game here on a beautiful Thursday afternoon right here on LHSN. At Lynchburg, we don't fear change. We embrace it in our students, on our campus, in our community, and around the world. We're building on our legacy of always moving forward. It's the same place with a new name. Welcome to the University of Lynchburg. We've got a 43-on-43 43 43 matchup coming your way, and that's because Angel Cuyazo has entered the ballgame for the Hornets from the bullpen. And this season, he's been really good. 13th appearance, 2-1-3 ERA. Just under 13 innings of work. And every single time he comes into the game, he's high energy. And you have to think the Hornets are going to feed off of him in the middle stages of this ballgame. Love what Angel brings to the mound and to the entire team. Saw him yesterday in the fifth inning. That was the fifth inning for Lynchburg yesterday, Evan, that featured three outs from three different pitchers. Brandon Pond, the starter, got the first out on the leadoff batter. Went to Travis Shoemate to get Ethan Iannuzzi out, and then it was this man, Angel Collazo, that finished the inning with a strikeout. He was pumped, dugout was pumped, crowd was into it. Just a classic baseball moment here at Fox. And I, now we'll, we'll wait and see. Is Angel just on for the left-on-left -left matchup here, the 43-on-43 matchup, or will he work the entire inning? Obviously, he's done some of each this season. But lately, it has been kind of a one- or two-batter role matchup situation for Angel, but we'll see. Very rare situation to see three different pitchers in an inning. That one almost came back and got him as – Patrick Rogan is aboard. Once again, leading off the inning, getting on base, and that is the fifth time in five innings that the Pacers have been able to do so. And that will bring up Jake DeCunto, batting 358 on the season. That one there, this, this one right here will startle you. As on hell, looked like he maybe even got just a Barely a piece of the leather on that ball as it came 
through. But, yeah, that'll shock you a little bit as a pitcher. Not a warm and fuzzy feeling at all to have to react to that line drive coming back in your direction. But we've got our answer now. It's more than just one batter for Angel. He's going to stay out there and deliver strike one. As a pitcher, you're really the top target for that ball coming back. That's something we saw earlier with Jorman being able to get the bunt and throw it back to second. You have to really react quickly. This one pulled foul. Also a little loud coming off of the barrel. So we'll do it again. DeConto shortstop for the Pacers today, facing an 0-2 count. Two for two for Jake DeConto from Raleigh, North Carolina. 12th multi-hit game of the season. He's got a five-hit game on record this year. So he obviously, uh-oh, might have his third hit of the ball game. This one lifted into left center. Neves, Atkins going after it. Avery Neves pulls it in. Brogan faked going to second. He'll stay put at first. And that's out number one. Solid work from Neves. Talked about it earlier. You know he's going to make his contributions out in left field. And with that, it's going to bring up Jacob Norris. 485 on base percentage this season, batting 277. The third baseman. And Cuyazo with the pitch. It's going to be low. So 1 0 count. Haven't seen too much base stealing from the Pacers today. There have been a lot of pass balls. Have a Hornets error earlier in this ball game on one of the throws back into the infield. Runner was going there, maybe opened up a little bit bigger hole for Jacob Norris to roll that one through the infield. First to third goes Pat Rogan, and now it's runners at the corners for the William Peace offense, which appears to be back in business. Almost spoke that one into existence with the runner going to second, but now Roseboro is gonna step in with runners on the corners, and we're gonna have a mound meeting. You mentioned it. Lots of times with Coach Beasley, you're going to see pitchers coming in and out for different matchups, and that is what's going to happen now. So we'll take a quick break here on LHSN. We've got a one-run ball game on Fox Field. Look what you're missing. A lot of people go to the universities to find something to be a part of while getting their education. And when you come here, Lynchburg is that something, it becomes a family. It's what the school's really good at doing. Into the game for the Hornets. It's going to be Baylor Cumbie, the fourth pitcher, to enter this one. It will be his seventh appearance on this season. And five and a third innings of work. As he continues his warm up tosses. It's a hot one here on Fox Field. A little Thursday midweek baseball action coming to you, the Hornets are going to be tested this weekend as they travel to Shenandoah for a pair. And now on first in the conference, it's going to be a very exciting matchup. And to add on to things, they're both in the top ten nationally. Yeah, it's so much on the line this weekend. There was a lot on the line yesterday here at Fox Field against Randolph-Macon. You can make a case there's as much or more on the line this weekend in that Weekend doubleheader between Shenandoah and Lynchburg. It's an ODAC regular season title potentially hanging in the balance. They're also trying to build up that uh, that resume for maybe an at-large bid if you don't end up winning the conference tournament. So a lot of factors 
as Cumbie tosses over to first base there before he'll throw his first pitch of the ball game. One out in the top of the fifth. Sean Roseboro at the plate. Doing the catching duties today, shows bunt. And that's gonna be caught strike. Seen a few times this year and it's a very interesting concept that maybe is growing a little bit, but you'll see that runner from first trying to steal second and maybe send the one from third. And the Pacers who have found ways all season to steal are capable. That would have been a nice bun if it stayed fair, but it's an 0-2 count. Yeah, that first to third defensive coverage is a classic one that college teams are going to cover and work on quite a bit throughout the season. You got your basics, obviously. You can throw through to second, try to get the guy stealing. You can pump to second, throw to third. You can have one of your middle guys cut in front of second and try to get the out at home that way if he takes off. So you have some options, and it seems like most college teams do practice pretty much all of those options. Not that you're necessarily going to use them, but you got, you got them in there. The old straight throw to third is an option as well that we've seen some this season too. Maybe you get that runner at third just leaking out, leaning a little bit, try to fire there on the steal attempt. 0-2 oh, count for Cumby. Delivers. Strike three, runners going to second, and now the runner is coming home. So just as we talked about, the Pacers are able to capitalize and tie up this ball game. All knotted at four. Rogan scored from third. It was Norris who advanced to second, and Roseboro is called out. Here's the replay. Mm. Close play, almost got his helmet. Yeah, I think he did get the helmet. Just hard to tell from that angle if the foot was on the base yet or not. It was a good fast release from Sean Pokerock. Had life on the throw. Just a little bit upstairs, Ben Jones climbs the ladder. And gets the tag down, but just not in time. 1-0 count as Cumbie misses there. Fundamentally, it really didn't seem that there was much wrong on that play. They executed about as well as they could have, but again, that's the risk you take with the runner coming from third. If you're late in the games, inning seven, eight, nine, maybe just inning nine, obviously that tying run is going to be more important. You may just let the guy steal second. You might even just have your catcher eat it rather than trying to throw him out there. Pitch to Joseph, fouled off, one, two count. Adam Joseph, a single and a strikeout. So runner on second for the Pacers. Two down for Baylor Cumby, who's a strike away from getting out of this inning. You can see the stuff, Evan. Cumbie's got great stuff. You talk to everybody on the staff. They're one of the first guys, he's one of the first guys mentioned as far as just stuff, action on the pitch, hard to hit. You can see it, off balance swings here from William Peace. And I bet Baylor Cumbie's looking for more than an off balance swing. He's looking for a punch out right here. We'll see what he can do. One, two, pitch. He's gonna come inside. To your point. It's always interesting as a pitcher because some will blow it right by you. It seems like Kelby has a nice variety of options he can use of, of his arsenal. Yeah, hitters hitting just 176 against Baylor Cumbie. That's second on the team. Seems to find a way. Another pitch inside. So full count runner on second. Big pitch coming here. Like that like that deep breath you could see Baylor Cumbie take on the mound. Seems to be pretty composed. It's going to be inside and fouled off. So we'll do it again. Keeps attacking with that breaking ball on Adam Joseph, and that's one where you balance the scouting report as far as what the hitter can do with your best stuff as a pitcher. Sometimes you throw the scouting report out the window and just go with your best pitch. I know he's capable of it. 
It's going to be some contact going out towards right, and it will go foul. So nice work from Joseph in this at bat. And so that's the other side of the coin, Evan, too, coming with your best pitch over and over again. He gets a chance to see that breaking ball multiple times and measure it, time it up, line it up a little bit more. See if there's a change, fastball maybe, or maybe Baylor stays with the breaking stuff. Question of who will bite first. Runner was going, but will have to return. Looked like a fastball to me. Good pitch, good piece of hitting. It's just, just good baseball all the way around right there, and you got to try it again. Another full count delivery coming. Pacer struggling to get some good contact on Cumby. See what if he can get the Hornets out of this fifth. And there it is, a nice pitch from Cumby. He's going to win this battle, and the Hornets are going to be up to the plate. But this game is knotted at four on Fox Field when we come back. has given me the flexibility to pursue my passions and my interests and I've recreated my identity for myself aside from just being an athlete. My greatest personal discovery has been that I am capable of doing things that I didn't know I was capable of doing. To be able to study what I wanted to and continue to play the sport I love, all of those things came together very nicely in one package in Division Three. Right back with you here on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. Going to have a pinch hitter in Cam Lane, who will step into the left-handed batter's box. O'Donovan was due up to start this bottom of the fifth. So it will be Lane, Jones, and Atkins here for the Hornets. It's still Conway on the mound for the Pacers. Both squads, four runs, seven hits. And one error. Yeah, the three big numbers on the scoreboard are identical. They've got them in different ways. Lynchburg scored two in the first, one in the second, one in the third, none in the fourth. And for William Peace, it was donuts in innings one and two. They scored two in the third, blanked in the fourth, and then one across there in the top half of the fifth. That's the beauty of baseball. You can get it in different ways. In the end, you got to be leading in the ninth. Lane hit by pitch. And we're in his way to first as Ben Jones steps in. 0 for 1, the strikeout. He walked in the second. All season long, one of the freshmen that has just continued to perform. It's a Hornet squad both from a pitching standpoint and a batting standpoint, it seems like they're a freshman up and down this roster. It's another hit by pitch for Cam Lane, who, if you don't know baseball fans, is the all-time leader in that category here at the University of Lynchburg, 52 in his career. Now, 52 times Cam has been plunked. And that one was, was just well behind him, Evan. He wasn't, there was no leaning in or diving or trying to roll into an inside fastball or anything. That was just a big miss off the right hand of Justin Conway. And Cam Lane's body just happened to get in the way. It's always interesting because hit by pitch is one of those stats that you wonder how much you really earn and how much it just coincidentally happens. But Cam Lane has just gotten himself into good situations especially can afford that chance to maybe crowd the plate a little bit more. Mm, almost another one there as Ben Jones had to roll out of the way of that punch up and in. Hitters count 
Chance to do some damage. Pacers continuing to strike back. But Lynchburg will have two on early here as we begin the bottom of the fifth. And it's the nine hole, Carson Atkins, who will step up to the plate. Uh, I want to talk about that hit by pitch stuff for Cam Lane here in just a minute, but maybe we'll wait for a mound visit and give the spotlight to Carson Atkins, who hits with runners on first and second. Sacrifice bunt potentially in play. Yeah, Atkins shows it early. Wow, another one. Wide left off the backstop, almost to play on lane at third. But the runners do advance, so no need for the sacrifice bunt now. Sacrifice fly time or more from Carson Atkins. You would love to see it. It was a throw to third that looked to have skipped in the dirt, as you see right here. And nice work at third base by Norris to corral it. That's a play where things can get a little bit difficult if it skips past the third baseman. You might have one or even two scoring. But Atkins would love to bring him in himself. Here comes the pitch. Going to be caught strike 1-1. One, one. Another one for Lynchburg where the assignment is elevate. Hopefully you celebrate after that as well, but looking for the sack fly, looking for the double. Homer would be very nice. But but the miss has got to be up when you if if you do miss on this swing, Evan, you're telling your hitter, hey, we'd rather you fly out or hit a pop up here than hit a ground ball in this situation. Although the base is loaded situation, that's even more imperative to do that. We saw that with Gavin Collins when the bases were loaded in the last inning. The last result you want is the ground ball double play. And that's not a knock on Gavin Collins. I mean, he was trying to get the ball in the outfield, just didn't execute, you know. Happens to everybody. Lynchburg has left quite a few on base today, and that's one of those stats that, again, this season has maybe kept them out of the run column. But for now, it's a full count, and Atkins trying to cause some damage. Runners on second and third. So the force will only be at first. Yeah, Lynchburg's left eight on so far. Of course, the inning is far from over here with nobody away. Low and away. And Atkins is going to move 90 feet. So they're loaded for the top of the lineup. And Brandon Garcia will step in one for two day with a walk. Maybe most notably, it was that fielding play out of shortstop. Just a nice leap to get it earlier on. And maybe why Lynchburg and William Peace are still tied. Looks like a pitching change now, so we'll take a moment and figure that out. So, Evan, let me go back to the hit-by-pitch thing about Cam Lane. You, you, you said you know, you kind of debate how much of it is, is a skill and all that. I think you got a couple plays, that, that, a couple things happening when you set a career record like that. For one, Cam Lane's a grad student. He's played a lot. To, to get a record like that, you're going to need to be in the lineup a lot. You're going to have to be in that batter's box uh, as a target for the pitcher to hit you quite a few times. Uh, and then the other factor is Cam Lane stands on the inside part of that batter's box line. So that's going to let you get hit a little bit more. And I think the third factor that, that is in his control is he doesn't get out of the way. He doesn't jump out of the way. He's okay with a little bit of pain, a little bit of bruising uh, as his career has gone on. I don't think he really dives into many. I don't think he's that guy, but he just does not get out of the way, and he seems to maybe even enjoy getting hit a little bit. Now, back to your other point, some of it's out of his control. Like the most recent one, that pitch was almost behind him, really. He, he, there's a few that we've seen this season where Cam Lane couldn't get out of the way if he wanted to, just couldn't react in time. So I think a record like that, definitely a lot of factors at work. Um, and maybe that's the same way with any of those career records to where take Avery Neves with the career walk record. A lot of it is his eye and his pitch selection. But then sometimes pitchers are just going to not be able to control where they throw the baseball, and you're going to get some walks that way as well. So you got multiple factors at work, I think. And we got a new pitcher to work. Will be Nathaniel Varnier. That's a very good point, too, because – 
some of that you really just can't teach. I mean, for Lane just to stay in the batter's box and not flinch, that's something that is garnered with experience and throughout his career, as you said, he has been very good at getting hits in multiple ways. Yeah. Getting hit and getting hits. That's true. Cam Lane is a great hitter. I, and I think he would prefer to swing the bat rather than get hit. But I don't think he minds getting hit. You like to get things done maybe a little bit more emphatically if you're in the batter's box. Yeah. They give you that bat for a reason as a hitter. You want to use it. Try to get one over the wall, and that's exactly what Brandon Garcia is going to do, stepping up with the bases loaded, no outs. And it's number 59, Nathaniel Varnier for the Pacers. An 8.76 ERA, eighth appearance on the season. He has a win, just over 12 innings. And he faces the top of the Lynchburg lineup. He's going to be in there for strike number one. Back to that assignment again of getting the ball elevated, get the ball in the outfield grass. That becomes a little bit tougher with a new pitcher, and it's a left-on-left -left situation. But Brandon Garcia's got that in mind. He'll hit this one hard to the second baseman. Maybe a double play ball again, Evan. And they will get it. Two down, and for William Peace, that's a down. As good of a situation as you could have gotten as just one scores for the Hornets. That double play is really continued to bring struggles for the Hornets offense. Second time in as many innings as they've hit into a double play with the bases loaded. One run does come in, 5-4, Hornets take the lead back. It's actually not an RBI for Brandon Garcia. Weird statistical oddity there. If you ground into a double play and score a run, you don't get an RBI. If you just ground into one out, just a regular 4-3, it would be an RBI, but that's that's a talking point for another day. A little bit of extra incentive maybe to try and bust down the first baseline and steal one, but Garcia was unable to beat the throw. Logan Webster is in the batter's box. He bats 259 this season, 376 on base percentage. The Hornets with a runner on third. I like what William Peace has done with their different pitchers. I mean, they're using three completely different guys. Lefty Pollard started it. He threw hard, good breaking ball. Then they go to the side armor, Conway. And now you get another tall, lanky lefty with a over-the-top arm action. And he is efficient in doing so, and that's going to end the fifth. So the Pacers hold the Hornets just to one, but they regain the lead here at Fox Field as we continue in this non-conference baseball matchup. If you're just tapping in here on Fox Field, we've got another pitching change, the fifth of the day. It will be the freshman, Logan Tapman. ZRA right at three. Two wins on the season. He's been very impressive. 18 innings of work. Hornets likely looking for him to go a couple innings in this one. And it's been a back and forth ball game, but the Hornets have the lead as we enter the top of the sixth, five to four. 
one of those freshmen. Lynchburg loves out of the bullpen. Logan Tappan, Berlin, Maryland, the Eastern Shore area, just outside Ocean City. He has been outstanding all season. How about the freshman crew out of the pen, though? Evan, Logan Tapman, your guy, Matt Cassidy. You got Mason McDowell, who we saw in this game. You got Trevor Barnes, who's been good out of the bullpen. And you get some of those grizzled veterans to go with it there, guys like Angel Collazo and Baylor Cumbie that we've seen. Uh, a few more veteran options out of the pen as well, including Jack Batchmore. And uh, Alex Gianna Scoli falls in that category as well as far as seniors out of the pen. It's a nice mix for Lynchburg, it really is. Well, it seems that they've found success with so many different options, and that's what every great ball club finds ways to do. It's obviously using that experience, but still being able to have the talent in all around this lineup. It seems that Lynchburg has found ways this season as Tetman throws his first for a ball. It's barefoot. Up to the plate, and he is going to pop out to right. That's out number one. That will bring up Nick Tyler, batting 294. So far in this one, a strikeout and a pop-up. This is the part of the ball game and we touched on the middle innings being some of the more big ones for the Hornets. Hold that thought as it's down the line and into the grass on the outfield will wait for confirmation it might have stayed foul. Shadows in the left field a little difficult to judge. Yeah, it, it was foul, Evan. It was deceiving, though, because the way the ball caromed back in, Avery Neves actually picked it up in fair territory. Uh, and it was close anyway, so kind of difficult to tell there. But Neves chucked it back in, and we're ready to go again. Either way, solid contact for the center fielder. 0-1 count as Tapman delivers. It's always interesting just across every level of baseball seeing shadows and seeing their effects. Really having day games here at Fox Field, they don't become too problematic. But we know that you travel or even have a little bit of a later ball game, they can certainly cause some trouble. Yeah, and so many guys in the big leagues you look at their splits between the day and night games and it's kind of outstanding some people that hit so much better under the lights and others do not need the natural light and then there's a another category of hitters who it doesn't matter that the splits are the same the average is going to be the same no matter when they play the game the greatest seem to find a way regardless of the conditions it's going to be fouled back nice at bat here from tyler with a 2-2 count. Here at Fox Field, no night games. You really have until the sun sets to conclude the action. We've seen ties in college baseball sometimes just because there aren't any lights on the field, something you don't necessarily see in the pros. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, when, when's the last professional tie, I wonder? Major League Baseball tie, we'll say anyway. And it looks like the, the LHSN research team is going to get on that and have an answer for us probably before the inning ends. But no promises just yet. Very fortunate to have an incredible staff here at LHSN and all around the sports realm at Lynchburg. It's oh. always exciting. Yeah, we got the answer, Evan. It's not as actually far back as I thought. 2016, we had a tie between – the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Cubs postponed because of weather. They moved it back later on in the season, and then they determined that the game would not out, uh, affect the postseason at all, so they just ended it in a tie. So there you go. How about that? I figured, I figured it was going to be like 1896 or so, uh, something somewhere like that. Somewhere close. <laughs> right. Not 2016. Well, there you go. It's going to be head out to center for out number two. We're being told to make sure we mention that that was the year the Chicago Cubs broke the curse and won the World Series in 2016 
as well. So in recent years, teams that have a tie on the record are 1-0 and in World Series play. So that could be a good sign for the next team that gets a tie in Major League Baseball. Not sure how many managers in the MLB are going to go start asking for ties <laughs> yeah. if they're all right. leveled up after right. nine. <laughs> go to the umpire. Hey, it's getting real dark out here, fellas. We ought to we ought to call it a game here. Sometimes you find ways, and then others see games that will go on 16, 17 innings, and then you call it. And it's always part of the game, all in good fun. As Kemp steps into the box, he's got a 1-1 one -one count. Yeah, Kemp, one for two, had the walk in there as well. Very good hitter. You can just see that when he gets in the box. He really looks the part, looks good in the uniform, swings the bat well, turns it loose. Now the LHSN Research Department increasingly busy as we're getting the uh, longest game in Major League history. Turns out that was a 26-inning affair in 1920 by the Brooklyn Robins and the Boston Braves. Man, who who could forget those great Brooklyn Robins teams back in the 20s? Must have been even before they changed to the trolley Dodgers, Evan. How about that? Yeah. Big. You, have, you have to go back a little little more than 2016 <laughs> for that one. <laughs> yeah. Tapman with the pitch. It's going to be pulled to the second baseman and out number three. So Tapman solid here in the top of the sixth. But at Fox Field, the Hornets have a one-run lead on LHSN. Three, four, five in the Hornets lineup. We'll be due up here in the bottom of the sixth. Evan Gates and Kyle Haney taking you through all the action. And a non-conference matchup. The All-American at the plate so far today. One for three. Had an RBI single in the first that got Lynchburg on the board. Yeah, first time seeing the big, tall, lanky lefty, Nathaniel Varnier, and it's an 0-2 count for Avery Neves against the Southpaw. So far, eight pitchers total between the two teams. That one's going to be in the dirt. You figure sometimes in a midweek matchup, that's the situation that you're going to see, lots of bullpen action especially when you have Coach Beasley on the Hornets squad who likes to look into some of the matchups, might have a pitcher just face one or two batters. But Varnier here in his second inning of work, and he strikes out the All-American for out number one. Looks like a fastball upstairs that Neves couldn't get on top of. And Eric Hyatt has been on board twice, E6 and a hit by pitch. He also popped up to the third baseman. So in the books, it's an 0 for 2 day, even though Eric Hyatt has actually reached base more than he hasn't. And he'll take strike one from Varnier. That's why sometimes the scorebook won't tell you the entire story. Hyatt, 
throughout the season. He's played in some of these big games, and it really seems that he feels comfortable when he's up in the lineup. Out of Woodbridge, Virginia, batting 371 on the season. 439 on base percentage. Had 35 at-bats coming into this one. Going to pop one up to the second baseman shading over into right field. There's going to be almost a collision, but Joseph holds on for out number two. Communication is key, and Joseph able to call that one out. Call that one before coming down for the out, as you see right here. Good second look. Right fielder was in the area, I think, Coach Charlie Long. If he saw that tape, he would prefer to have the right fielder catch that ball. Easier play for the outfielder coming in. But those infielders are stubborn, stubborn Evan. Sometimes it's hard to call them off when they're barking after it. So the out gets made by the second baseman, Adam Joseph. So we see right here, Poker Rock at the plate. He had a homer earlier in this one. Again, you don't know how many homers you're going to get at Fox Field, so everyone that goes over the fence is a pretty special one. Poker Rock, one for two with the homer and a walk. And Marnier will get the strikeout, so quick inning for the Pacers. And two-thirds of the way done right here on LHSN. We'll be right back. We are right back with you here on LHSN. And a few defensive substitutions. We have Holden Fiedler now behind the plate for the Hornets and Jackson Harding out in right field. So you see Fiedler behind the plate as they finish up those warm-up tosses. As anticipated, it will be Logan Tapman staying out on the mound. And for the Hornets, just a one-run lead, so a one swing ball game that the Pacers are going to try and utilize. It's interesting because a lot of games here at Fox Field this season, it seems that the Hornets have had pretty solid leads at this stage of the ball game, but the Pacers have done a nice job of really not making mistakes and being able to capitalize with runners on base. We knew this Pacer team would be tough. We knew it would be maybe a little bit more difficult for Lynchburg to get up and get elevated after the big win yesterday. Kind of a, a – the, the term trap game is so overused, I think, in sports, Evan. But, you know, it probably fits the bill after you get a big conference victory over a team ranked in the top ten. Then you have to play a non-conference opponent who's not really a rival. You feel like it could be ripe for a letdown, and this is not a letdown by any means. It's still a 5-4 Lynchburg lead. I think some fans may be looking for a blowout in this one, but you and I know baseball doesn't work that way. Everybody's tough. You throw out the records with everybody. This is part of the reason why the game is so fun. You never know what you're going to get. Again, a Pacers squad that throughout the season, their performances might not meet what is said on the score sheet. 16 and 16, a chance to go over 500 in this one. 
as. Yeah, it could be a rallying cry for them, actually. I, I, I didn't think about it, but that's an interesting point. You know, that's a, as a coach, you're looking for anything to motivate your team, maybe any edge possible. And so, yeah, if you can use that, hey, let's get back over 500 as kind of a, a carrot to hold out in front there, not a bad ploy at all for a coach. Pitch will be called, strike three. Much to the chagrin of Ward, who was called out. We'll take another look at that pitch from Tapman. And now batting number 43, Pat Rogan. Maybe yeah. a little bit inside. Great presentation by Fiedler, though, to stick it right there and, and really get it out front before it continued to move into the body of the hitter. But it was just a classic riding two-seam fastball. Saw a lot of action on that, a lot of horizontal movement back into the hitter's hands. So you get a, a real indication there of what makes Tapman so tough to hit. When you can throw a pitch like that, that it really looked like it started middle-middle, Evan, but by the time it was finished, it was up under the hands of, of Ward. That's why there was no swing from Ward, just lots of movement and unable to get the call. And again, Fiedler with the nice presentation for his first Banner faced out the game. That's Rogan in for the Pacers with one down, 2-0 count. Tapman's going to get the call there. And that's another one where a catcher really shows his value. It's not, not really stealing a strike. It's getting the strikes your pitcher is entitled to. You're not necessarily thinking as a frame artist back there that, hey, I'm trying to turn a ball into a strike. That's not necessarily what you're doing. It's just making sure you get all the borderline strikes called. Everything on the black your guy gets. And Holden Fiedler is so good about that. Single dumped into center field by Pat Rogan is his second hit of the ball game. And Dakota will now step in for the Pacers. He has a single and a double. Playing shortstop today. Tapman looks back at first. Throw outside. We'll see how active Rogan wants to be on the base pads. Situation now where it's not really desperation time, but you know that Lynchburg can get hot very quickly, so you want to keep this game close as long as you can. Almost identical pitch will be outside again, so 2-0 count. DeCanto at cleanup, not someone that you want to test. Batting 358 on the season. 40 hits last year for DeCanto. He's on his way to getting that many this season. He's got 12 multi-hit games, including this one today. You get more high awareness from the backstop, Holden Fiedler, to go out there and chat with his battery mate. Two pitches that were in the other batter's box. So Fiedler sees that and decides to go have the conversation. So good with these little defensive timeouts, Holden Fiedler. I say it just about every game because just about every game he seems to go out there at the right time. And he understands the element of, of how, to, how to get through to each pitcher. Each guy's different. Some guys, some guys you got to be a little softer with, Evan. Some guys you got to have a little bit of a, a harder edge as Holden Fiedler and Logan Tapman get together working on maybe the grip out there. It is a hot day. It's going to be some perspiration early in the season. College baseball, it's cold and windy. You got the dry air. Pitchers can't get a grip then. And then that all changes when you get later on in the year. You start getting these warm days where the sweat can present a problem. You never know what you're going to get come tournament time either. We've seen, obviously, different geographical battles. But then, right here in Virginia, seems like no two days are the same. 2-1 count here to DeCanto. And much to your point with Fiedler, it never seems like there's an opportunity that's too early to go have a chat with your pitcher. Want to keep him on top of things. Ball will get free, but Rogan will stay put. Good hustle from the second baseman, Ben Jones. That's one that a lot of second basemen don't do is break over on those pickoff attempts, but I like how he does that. 
he's probably not going to get to one to the fence before the first baseman. But if you have a deflection or something like that, that's where your second baseman backing up could be of some value to run down a loose ball that way. And it's going to be hit through the five hole. We'll get back to Neves, who is going to hold Rogan at second. So two on for the Pacers. There's just one out. And Zetman is going to have to make some plays here for the Hornets. Third hit of the ball game for DeCunto. He's putting together some nice stuff. And here is another visit from associate head coach Travis Beasley. So we'll wait for a moment and see what happens with Logan Tapman. It looks like he will hand the ball off to Coach Bees. Well, he hasn't left the mound just yet, Evan. Uh, next time we're back at home is going to be next week. Lynchburg will host Greensboro on Wednesday of next week. They do travel to Shenandoah Sunday, the Hornets, to take on the Hornets. And then Tuesday it will be a road trip to Farmville taking on Hampton Sydney in another conference game there. So Lynchburg has five conference games left. Doubleheader against Shenandoah, one against Hampton Sydney, and then two here at home next Saturday, a week from this Saturday against Guilford. So a lot of business still to attend to, but we are basically three quarters of the way through the regular season now. And we've touched on it. There are certainly no gimmies in the ODAC, especially at this stage of the season. Tapman is still on the mound. He's going to pitch to Norris. Two on as that pitch is outside for ball one. Yeah, everything still hangs in the balance as far as an ODAC title goes. You got third ranked team in the country on the road this Sunday. Hampton Sydney's playing good baseball. Guilford's offense has been incredible this year. They're putting up some massive offensive numbers, the Quakers. So they're not going to be an easy out either. Hit and run play that got slapped to the other side. Collins got his glove on it, deflected it. Garcia has a little trouble picking it up. William Peace is pumped. And why wouldn't they be? They've scored the tying run and still have themselves in business. Runners at the corners with one out. Seems like every single chance the Hornets have had to inch in front, the Pacers have responded. And that's what ball clubs who hit well find ways to do, as you see on the replay. Really no play at third. And now you're going to have another mal meeting. You have to think that Tapman's day is done. So we're going to take a quick break here on LHSN, but it's a whole new ball game. We're tied up at five on Fox Field. Sixth pitcher of the ball game for the Hornets. It's going to be Alex Giannascoli who takes the mound in a pressure situation. Pacers out hitting the Hornets 10-7 at the moment and trying 
to surge in front. So Chapman went one and a third. As Roseboro steps up to the plate and this game is still certainly hanging in the balance as you said earlier. Gianna Scoli, one of those seniors that we mentioned, comes in with a 6.75 earned run average. This is appearance number seven. He was busy in the month of March, pitched five times in the month of March. Hornets will let Jacob Norris take second there. So now it is runners on second and third. It's been three straight singles for William Peace after a strikeout to open the inning. Looks like the infield is coming in, Evan. Situation here with one out. You might have to anticipate the blunt, but they'll swing at that one. And quickly 0-2 for Gianna Scoli. This would be a big out, maybe relieve a little bit of that pressure. We know that the Hornets still have options in their bullpen. They'll certainly try to utilize, but with two games against Shenandoah this weekend, you wonder how much rest will be a factor. Clean contact that's going into the outfield. Center fielder Atkins, he's going to have a throw, but it won't be enough. And Roseboro will have a sack fly. The Pacers take a 6-5 lead. First lead of the ball game for the Pacers. They've been in it the entire game. This is actually the first time they've been in front, 6-5. William Peace leads, so we can keep an eye on that stat. Lynchburg trailing in the seventh inning here to William Peace. You have a pinch hitter stepping in for the Pacers. That was solid work from Roseboro we mentioned earlier with the Hornets just trying to elevate, get one into the outfield, and in that situation it's just enough to propel them into the wheat. Yeah, I think it's number 49, Peyton Richards. He's hitting 182 on the season, left-handed swinger, so that might be part of the reason for the move from Coach Charlie Long. He is two for 11 on the season so far. Runner on second, two down here in the top of the seventh. The outside portion of the plate. Seen a little bit of everything this game. It's gone back and forth. I think for William Peace, they have certainly utilized the walk. It's going to be called strike one, two count. Walk's a big part of William Peace's offensive program, ninth in the country in walks for the Pacers. They can swing it a little bit too, as we've seen. Three singles in this inning. Good pitch from Gianna Scoli. See how nasty you can get here with two strikes and two outs. Here it comes in the dirt, maybe a little too nasty as they're gonna look at the runner back to second. Fiedler corrals it. Runner got in a little bit of no man's land. And you're gonna get a fantastic replay of that right there. Good stop from Holden Fiedler and a good scramble. Got to it quickly. Those catchers are, they're like wrestlers with how quickly they can get to their feet move around with those cat skills back there. All twos across the board here. Another two strike delivery coming from Gianna Scoli. It's gonna be grounded to second, should be an easy play. And it is, but the Pacers will hop to a one run lead. It's anyone's ball game here on Fox Field as it's stretch time. We'll be right back. College has given me the flexibility to pursue my passions and my interests, and I've recreated my identity for myself aside from just being an athlete. My greatest personal discovery has been that I am capable of doing things that I didn't know I was capable of doing. To be able to study what I wanted to and continue to play the sport I love, all of those things came together very nicely in one package in Division Three.
Fox Field. It's a whole new ball game as Pacers now lead six to five. And all season long, the Hornets have been tested, and this is the part of the ball game you really have to deliver. There's no panic button in the Lynchburg Hornets dugout, even if there was. I don't think anybody's going near it just yet. This is a pretty steady, even keel, level-headed ball club. They know about all the ups and downs throughout a college baseball season. They've been down before, but we are in those later innings, Evan. We're in the bottom of the seventh, and that's when you do start to feel maybe a little bit more pressure when you're behind on the scoreboard. Just a one-run ball game, and Litchburg's been so good at answering when the other ball club scores. They've been so good about stealing that momentum right back, and here's another opportunity for the Hornets to do that potentially on the offensive side. Gavin Collins swings at the first pitch. Peyton Richards, who was the pinch hitter, has moved to third. And moving from third to second was Norse. So a few defensive changes for the Pacers. Do up for the Hornets. It's Collins, Lane, and Ben Jones. Hitting six, seven, eight. Collins got contact on that one. Center fielder moving over and routinely putting him away. So one down. Just got under it, just missed it. Collins really got a good hack off right there. I think process wise. You're going to feel pretty good about that if you're Gavin Collins. Just couldn't quite stay on top of that ball that was not really up in the zone. It was it was really just above the belt. I think it was in, in the hot zone for Gavin Collins, but unfortunately just got under it. Sounded good coming off the bat. Just unable to do something with it. Lane might have a chance to get to first. He beats out the throw. And a nice hustle from Cam Lane down the line. Ricocheted off Varnier's glove. And Lane able to make a very solid play. Those are the ones that will keep you in a ball game or bring the lead to you as now Ben Jones steps in. Big time stuff for Cam Lane. Hit it hard, right back up the middle. Great hitting approach, it's what you want. Pitcher. Varnier really did well to get the leather on it. And then the shortstop to Kunto. Actually, pretty good throw and run. Or run and throw, maybe. But just not in time to get Cam Lane. Ball one to Ben Jones. A lot of times it's just about throwing off someone's momentum, whether it be the pitcher or the defense or an entire team. And those are the plays that can do it. Jones turns on one into right field. And this one's going to get over the right fielder's head. Lane is going to third, and the fielder is struggling with it. Lane is going home. It's going to be a tight play at the plate. He gets down. This ball game is tied. Big roar for Cam Lane as he slides in. Benny bombs. Ben Jones keeps this one in the yard, but explosive nonetheless as he plates Cam Lane for the tying run. And Ben Jones standing 90 feet away. The go-ahead run is on third base for Lynchburg with one out. Rogan was relatively pedestrian out in right field and took us a second to realize the ball was going over his head. And how about that hustle from Ben Jones, as you said, stretching it into a triple. And just like that, bit of a seesaw here. We're right back tied at six. I'm gonna give you a, a crazy stat. Those two hits for Lynchburg, a single from Cam Lane and a double there. It's their first hit since the third inning. Wow. That just goes to show the production can come in many ways. If you're Lucas Jones, obviously, you'd like to have some contact coming off the bats, but you get it done any way you can. There was there was some walks and a hit, hit by pitch in there, so some of that's out of your control. But still fascinating to think about. And as we touched on earlier, you got Carson Atkins in the nine hole. It's situations like these where you love his production. 2-1 count from Varnier. Infield's drawn in. Theoretically opens up the hitting lanes a little bit. 
Atkins liked that one, just unable to connect. And now it's two balls and two strikes. Now with two strikes, you may go to your two strike approach with the infield drawn in rather than feel so compelled to try to lift the ball in the outfield. Pitch waved at for strike three. So two down as we head to the top of the lineup. Brandon Garcia will be up to the plate. Double play in his last at bat. Double plays have caused some troubles for the Hornets today. He'd like to put that one to rest. Has a chance right here to take the lead. One for three with a walk, a strikeout, and hit into a double play. Brandon Garcia will watch a steep breaking ball come in for strike one. Varnier has continued to stay pretty composed out on the mound. Garcia's gonna get under that one and it should be an easy play out in center for Tyler. So once again, we're tied as we come out of the seventh inning at 6-6 at Fox Field. Eighth inning has arrived here at Fox Field in Lynchburg. The undefeated streak for the Hornets on the line here in a tie ball game. Lynchburg undefeated at 16-0 this season at home. 21-2 at home last year. And you go back to the previous seasons, it's been really good stuff here at Fox. 66 wins in the last four years. Evan, and you don't get numbers like that without pulling out a few close ones. Have to... Go deep into the game. You're not just going to blow everybody out in the first couple innings. Good teams can win these close, close ball games. Lynchburg did that yesterday. Trying to do it again here today. I think from a stat standpoint, you can really throw all the numbers out the window. This is a William Peace team who got swept by Pfeiffer. We know that Lynchburg played them last week. Relatively easy victory. But if you're trying all the matchup stuff, you don't pay attention to the here and now and the Hornets finding themselves in a close one. Good check swing and hold there from Cam Barefoot. He's facing Alex Gianna Scoli. Gianna Scoli still on. Came in last inning in relief of Logan Tapman. Sharp ground ball to Brandon Garcia. Textbook footwork throws across for out number one. With barefoot speed, he almost makes that one close at first. Good contact, and then yeah, you got to look at the tail end of the throw there from Brandon Garcia. Good strong arm from Garcia. That's another one. He's he's the total package, really. He's got all the tools to be successful. One out. Gianna Scoli deals strike one in there. We know the middle infield between Ben Jones and Brandon Garcia, as we touched on earlier this season, both graduates of Jordan High School in Durham. Not very often you get to play with someone for eight straight years dating back to high school. That's always something fun to watch. Yeah, that, that potentially could happen here with the duo that Coach Lucas Jones likes to call Batman and Robin. I don't know who is who. I don't know if one is specifically Batman and one is Robin, but they're, they're both really good. The caped crusaders out there. 
Brandon Garcia and Ben Jones. And two freshmen in the starting lineup a lot. Pretty impressive. There's Gianna Scoli, a good look at him. Wow, wiffle ball kind of a curve that Tyler barely got a piece of. Like how Gianna Scoli kind of comes set behind his back or behind the, behind the belt there, Evan. You can get a look at that. It's one of those that probably not in the textbook, probably not in the, the pitching manual, but just a great thing about the coaching staff here at Lynchburg. They allow everybody to be unique, do some different things. And sometimes if you're a guy looking for an edge, you try something like that, all of a sudden you find out it works, you stay with it. Fastball that Tyler just missed. Garcia under this, drifting towards center field slightly, but hauls it in for out number two. Leadoff man Brett Kemp, who has one hit on the day, one for three, a walk in there. Left-handed swinger. So this will be interesting to see if the plan of attack is different for Lynchburg here as far as how they go after Brett Kemp. Talked quite a bit about the scouting reports and how Lynchburg moves the defense around, but the scouting report, obviously, you're using that when you're thinking about how you're going to approach a hitter, too. Good two-seam fastball in at the knees for Gianna Scoli. 1-1 one, one count. Tie ball game. Two gone. Top eight at Fox Field. Wind is blowing out to right center. There's the breaking ball in for a strike. So that's a good plan of attack for a pitcher. Keep him off balance. Fastball, curveball, fastball, curveball. Let's see what the choice is. Think it was the heater, and he got the whiff from Brett Kemp. Big time K for Alex Gianna Scoli. He'll stride to the dugout. His team is tied with William Peace. Hornets coming up to hit in the bottom of the eighth. Yeah, fastball right down Broadway for Gianna Scoli for the K. There's a guy that was a key contributor in the win yesterday, Jackson Harding, the key man from Keysville, number two, had multiple hits. Evan, he is he's only hitting 619 in his last five ball games, Jackson Harding. I think he's swinging one of the best bats probably in his state right now, Jackson Harding, hitting over 500 in his last 10. So the hit streak is an eight-game hitting streak that Jackson Harding is going to put on the line. But how about five straight multi-hit games for Jackson Harding? He's doing it off the bench. He was in playing right field last inning. But Jackson Harding will try to lead off the bottom of the eighth inning and get a fire started for Lynchburg in a tie ball game, 6-6. We touched on it during the break, how he puts that hit streak. A little bit of a rough situation if you only get one at bat, but I think he'll be happy getting on base any way you can. And you have to think, there are some sparks flying from that bat right now with how he's been able to perform. That's someone that in this lineup, it's always an interesting stat. The great thing about Jackson Harding is he really doesn't care about the personal stuff. He's a team guy through and through. I don't think he'll mind one bit coming in to pinch hit right here. He, he probably doesn't even think about the hit streak. He is just a classic ball player. Randolph Henry High School, they've produced quite a few of them in their school history. Jackson Harding in that line for sure. Away target here for the big man Varnier. 
He delivers strike two. So Harding behind in the count early. 0-2 count on number two. Left on left situation for Jack Harding. That doesn't make it any easier, you wouldn't think. And you're facing a tough arm like Varnier as well. Here comes the 0-2 delivery. Harding held off. Good take there. Could hear the dugout really come alive to show their appreciation of the good piece of hitting and eyeballs from Jackson Harding. These are the spots that you have to come up big in, especially late in the ball game. We haven't seen many contests here at Fox Field that have come down to these last few, but this week we've seen a couple. Fastball down for ball two. It's a 2-2 two -two count on number two. That play he made over his shoulder running towards the fence line yesterday to rob that double from Iannuzzi was huge. Made a couple other good grabs, one coming in late in the game that he made look really easy, but off the bat was going to be tough. How about that? Heater continues. Jackson Harding slapping a single into right field. Nine games in a row for Jackson Harding. And he is on board the go-ahead run. Jackson Harding at first base. Well, you come up in a situation, no one batting before you, you have to go out there and do it yourself. And Harding able to just time after time find a way. Those are the plays that you look at when the postseason comes, just knowing how prepared your ball club is. And now you got Avery Neves batting behind him. Neves will twitch the hip but not pull the trigger. 0-1 count. Let's see if Avery Neves can get the barrel on something here from Varnier. Neves is one for four, did double in the first inning. That was that hustle double. I say hustle double, it was fielded pretty deep. And Neves hit it really hard. Exit velo on that one was probably off the charts for Avery Neves. Looking for hit number two right now. A one count. Harding leads off at first. Got to be careful with the lefty, obviously. Doesn't completely shut down the running game for Lynchburg, but makes you, makes you really ponder it a little bit more. One, one count. Nobody out in the bottom of the eighth. Neves knows it as well as anybody on the squad, but got to have a good eye at this point in the game, not get impatient. Love to get, get maybe a mound visit. We could talk about Neves' eye and pitch recognition and all those things that make him such a great hitter. Extend that thought to all the players on Lynchburg's team. They led the nation in walks two years ago, 2021. Most walks in the country as a team. And actually, Evan, they had more walks as a team last year, but but didn't lead the nation in the stat. They were they were near the top. And this year, both of these two ball clubs we're watching today take a lot of walks. Definitely part of hitting, getting a good pitch to hit. 2-1 count for Avery Neves, the conference leader all time in walks. Another one there where he got the bat off the shoulder, but did not let it fire. 2-2 two -two count. Common theme with these ball clubs, they both have found very good ways to hit. Have to think that the walks play a good part of it. Neves swings on it, gets under it. Drifted into shallow right field. Second baseman had to come back to grab that one, but it is an out, the first one of the inning, and it will bring up first baseman Eric Hyatt. There's the swing from Neves. Don't think he was too far out front. Just a pitch that was away, and he couldn't really s quite stay on it long enough to drive it to right field. Ends up getting under it for the pop-up. So leadoff single from Jackson Harding. He's on first. Eric Hyatt is the hitter. 0 for 3. It was a hit by a pitch and a reached on error in there. Takes strike 1. 0 1 count. 1 out. Bottom of the 8th inning. This is game 32 of 39 for Lynchburg. It's going to be an exciting finish for the Hornets. Our regular season ODAC title is within reach, but still a lot of hard work to do to pick it up. Lynchburg, if you don't know, is 14-2 in conference. They are leading in the ODAC standings right now. 0-1 count on Eric Hyatt. 
First baseman has played a lot lately. Hit and run play was on there. That was a ball, I think maybe a changeup upstairs that Hyatt, you could tell him he was you could tell he was trying to adjust the swing to try to get on top of that to execute the hit and run. He ends up fouling it off. Harding has just three stolen bases on the season over at first, but we've seen a few looks over and you have to think he'd love to be sitting in scoring position here with Hyatt at the plate. That one misses, one, two count. Hyatt has played a lot lately. It's six starts in the month of April, Evan. He started, it looks like, five times, or played five times anyway, in the month of March. Nothing to begin the season in February. One, two count on Eric Hyatt, a guy we have been seeing a lot lately. Gets the barrel on that. Good metal as this one is driven into the corner. Jackson Harding around turn two. He'll slide safely into third, and Eric Hyatt advances to second on the throw. So that's big time right there. Lynchburg two in scoring position in a tie ball game. First hit of the day for Hyatt, and there was no doubt that that one was getting down the line. Seems like he comes up big in every big moment. As you said, now a two in scoring position. Lynchburg in a very good spot. Quality base running from Jackson Harding as well. He seemed to read pretty early that that ball was going to be down and not catchable. Nice tight turn around second, and he slides safely into third in what could have been a little bit of a closer play there. Jackson Harding not exactly rolling the dice, but a little mini gamble there to, to press it hard around second base, and he slides in safely. We will get a pitching change here for William Peace. We'll pause, catch our breath, identify the new arm, and then bring it back in just a moment on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. Number 48, Josh Little, is in out of the bullpen for the Pacers to try to preserve the tie. This will be appearance number 11 for Josh Little. All of them out of the bullpen, Evan. So a relief specialist, just over 15 innings of work. And he's getting the ball in a tough spot here. Runners on second and third. Tie ball game, bottom of the eighth. One out for Lynchburg. Avery Neves popped out to the second baseman, but it was Jackson Harding, leadoff single, and then Eric Hyatt with a hit there, advance to second. Good base running by both guys, actually, really, when you when you think about it there. Harding, reading that that ball was gonna be down and getting to third, and then Hyatt, he read the throw out of the hand from the left fielder and realized he could advance to second. And you know, Little, being a true relief pitcher, no starts this season, he's accustomed to seeing Lineups in different spots and having runners on base, so we'll have to see how he can react. But as Gavin Collins steps in for the Hornets, he has two runners in scoring position. They uh, intentionally walked Sean Pokerock, or Holden Fiedler, excuse me. Fiedler's in Pokerock's spot, fan. So Holden Fiedler got intentionally walked. The bases are loaded now, and it is Gavin Collins who just took Strike one from Josh Little. Collins is looking for his first hit of the ball game. No time like the present for number 15, Gavin Collins. Breaking ball in the dirt, good stop. Catching play, blocking is gonna be so important in a tight ball game like this with the bases loaded. 1-1 one, one count now with one out. So yeah, Holden Fiedler is on first base for Lynchburg. Eric Hyatt stands at second. 
as Jackson Harding, the leadoff single to get the party started at third. Collins was on that off-speed pitch, but fouled it away. When anything that reaches the outfield grass should score Harding a third. Josh Little, the relief man coming in. Tough situation. See if he's up to the task here. One out. Look like they want to go in on Gavin Collins. Long hold and set. Got it there. Good location. Collins had to fight it off and ends up fouling it off his own body. He'll take some time to work out the kinks. Yeah, good pitch there from Josh Little. Getting that ball where it needed to be. Maybe a good thing that one wasn't fair, too, because you see a ground ball and maybe another double play. Hornets are facing that same problem they did earlier in this ball game. Lynchburg has hit into two double plays with the bases loaded in this contest today, baseball fans. Gavin Collins trying to avoid that. Swing and miss. Strikeout on same location fastball. That one was a little bit more elevated. Tough for Collins to catch up to. He'll flip the bat over to Cam Lane, who is one for one with a hit by pitch. This spot was occupied previously by Riley O'Donovan. O'Donovan two for two. I think this was just part of the plan coming in though. Riley O'Donovan to get two at bats as the DH and then sub Cam Lane in, let him get two or three at bats as the designated hitter. Two outs now, bases loaded. Tie ball game. Big spot for Cam Lane. Lays off what appeared to be a changeup from Josh Little. Though it doesn't feel like it, it might be a big pitch here from Little not to go down 2-0 because we know how well the Hornets can find ways to get on base, whether it be the walk or the hit. Lane swings at that one and fouls it off. He looked back at the umpire like maybe he thought he hit the catcher's glove with some catcher's interference. Didn't take a long time making the point, but it was just interesting to see Lane look back in the ump's direction. Kind of got my attention. 1-1 one, one count. Cam Lane hugging the inside part of that batter's box. That front foot's almost on the plate. 1-1 one, one count, two outs. Lane waits on that off speed, sends it to left. Tough play here. It is a foul ball. It just landed at the edge of the grass and warning track. So now it's a 1-2 count on Cam Lane. Here comes the two-strike approach. Trying to stay alive. Bases are loaded. William Peace would have an out available at any bag, including home plate, potentially, on the force. 6-6 six, six ball game. Both dugouts coming alive here. High volume from both teams. Here's the pitch from Little. Lane, hard to the shortstop. Down on a knee to field it. Flips an underhand to second for a key out right there. Lynchburg leaves him stranded again. We are tied and going to the ninth inning at Fox Field in Lynchburg.
Hunter Ward leads off to begin the ninth inning for William Peace. Pacers and Hornets tied at Fox Field. Alex Gianna Scoli still on for Lynchburg. He looks to me to be getting better and better. Evan seems to be finding a groove out there, gaining some confidence. This is his longest appearance of the season. Back-to-back -back swings and misses, like what we are seeing from Alex Gianna Scoli. Well, you know he's going to have to have his stuff here in this ninth inning facing Ward, Rogan, and DeCunto, excuse me, DeCunto. Part of this lineup that you can't miss against. Yeah, if you're William Peace, you feel pretty good about the fact that you've got two, three, and four due up here in the ninth inning. Can't ask for much more than that as a manager. Maybe you could ask for one, two, and three to be due up, but there's a strikeout looking for Alex Gianna Scoli, carving up Hunter Ward. Second K of the day for Hunter Ward. Second strikeout for Alex Gianna Scoli. That's a big one just for confidence. Coming in, you know that the Pacers are going to come at you. They obviously want to end this ball game as soon as they can, but Gianna Scoli with the way he's pitching, not allowing any gimmies. Options are available in the bullpen. Lynchburg has had two and three players kind of tossing, just not really getting hot, but staying warm over there in case needed. Pat Rogan has put together a pretty good game so far. Two singles, a walk, and a fly out to right field. Takes strike one, two one count. As Gianna Scoli hit the inner third there with a fastball. 6-6 six, six ball game here at Fox Field. That one's up and away. If you're joining us late, you've really missed a pretty good game. Lynchburg scored two in the first, one apiece in innings two, three, and five, and also inning number seven. That's how they got their six. This one into the elevator shaft and up for Ben Jones, who comes on to make a relatively easy grab for out number two. And speaking of guys having a day, Jake DeCunto, the shortstop, is three for four. There's a double in there as well for number 12. But the way he's heading, you almost want to afford a walk before you give him a ticket with a hit. And you know that following right behind, Norris has had two singles in his last two at-bats. Again, it's a Pacer squad. We've said it time and time again today. It's talent all across the board from a hitting standpoint. William Peace is exactly 500. But when you look at the numbers, they've got a higher batting average for the team than Lynchburg. Uh-oh, this one airborne. Collins will go after it. Garcia and Neves all giving chase. It'll drop in the Bermuda Triangle and foul. Wow. Long run from all three guys. It, it, it becomes reactions, and then when you turn and get lined up for where you're going, then it's just a dead sprint. It's just a drag race at that point to see if you can get to it in time. But it is just a long foul ball. Gianna Scoli will give his fielders a chance to dust themselves off and catch their breath. And honestly, the hitter, Jake DeCunto, he was hard out of the box as well, Evan, so he probably doesn't mind a little breather to get his wind back. Here's the tail end of the long run. Really, three guys were, were equidistant to that ball as yeah. it nearly dropped in, and we get a visit from one of those aces, Mr. Brandon Pond popping in here to take care of something. Swing and a miss from DeCunto. Big pitch from Alex Giannascoli to get him out. Three hits on the day for DeCunto, but the fourth one doesn't come here. We are tied. Heading to the bottom of the ninth, 6 6 ball game at Fox Field. To them, the whole world looks like an opportunity, one to be seized, built upon, 
and made better for their sport and the people around it. To student athletes, every opportunity is a chance to change what could be and show the world what opportunity can do. We're going to the bottom of the ninth tie ball game at Fox Field. We were asking when's the last time this happened. Lynchburg actually was tied in the bottom of the ninth against Bridgewater earlier this season. They got the walk-off win there. You're getting to see the leadoff man, Ben Jones. We got a clip of his cut in his previous at bat, an extra base hit. Cam Lane scored on that one. We are tied 6-6 at Fox Field. Hornets undefeated at home. 16-0, and they're getting taken right to the limit, right to the finish line here in this one. Ben Jones clubs this into center field. This is going to be a tough play. It is down. It's at least two and maybe three for Ben Jones. He'll turn and burn around the bag. Throw coming in, but Jones slides in safely for the triple, and the winning run is just 90 feet away for Lynchburg. Talk about clutch. Benny bombs another one, Evan. It didn't leave the yard, but it was explosive. It had the bang out there in center field. How many times can you say you had two triples in a ball game and also doing it in back-to-back -back fashion? And now Lynchburg a chance to put things to rest. Center fielder really broke on it well, I thought. That was Nick Tyler, but couldn't get to it. Infield is in. Winning run is at third base, and it is a new hitter, Eddie Gimbel. Eddie Gimbel pinch hitting for Lynchburg. He actually appeared in that Bridgewater game and was part of a comeback victory for Lynchburg in a game they walked off in early March. Josh Little, the pitcher for William Peace, comes in with a breaking ball for strike two. 0 oh, 2 the count on Eddie Gimbel. Infield drawn in. Outfield is in as well, Evan, and that's a key because any deep fly ball, you wouldn't have a chance to throw out Ben Jones anyway. So that's smart by the Pacers. Swing and miss on a hard fastball. Climb the ladder there. Little, I think he dug deep for a little bit extra on that one, Evan. That had some steam coming off it. Garcia slaps it to the second baseman. He'll hold, long look at Jones over there at third base who has to stay put, and it's the second out of the inning. Garcia was out in front of that one. I think he was expecting heater from Josh Little, and Little took something off of that. So it's a 4-3 force out. And now Jackson Harding swinging the hottest bat on the team, maybe beyond. Jack Harding has six He's, a, he's got a nine-game hitting streak. He's got the winning run at third. He'll look at a curveball for strike one, 0-1 oh, one count. Yeah, it's five straight multi-hit games for Jackson Harding. This would be six. He is one for one off the bench today in this one. Drove that single into right field. Doesn't matter where it goes on this at bat. Rolls it to first base, but foul. So now it's an 0-2 oh, count for Jackson Harding. If anybody is the guy to be in the box right now, I think it's Jackson Harding. 0-2 count on him, though. Here's the pitch from Little. Fastball up and out. Ben Jones scrambling back to third base. He's extending that lead a little bit, anticipating perhaps a ball getting by the catcher. Can win a game that way as well. 1-2 now on Jackson Harding. Little set, turns, fires. Off the plate again. <laughs> and it really is the deuces wild up on the board now. Two strikes. Two balls, two outs on number two. It's a 6-6 ball game. Bottom of the ninth at Fox Field. Hornets trying to extend the winning streak. Here's the pitch from Little. It did get by him. It got under the catcher. Ben Jones is going to score. He gets to waltz home. It's a walk-off victory for Lynchburg. Benny Bombs leads off with a triple to the fence and comes in to score on the passed ball with two outs. 
A little bit of heartbreak for the Pacers, but the Hornets win it. Here's the scamper home. Jackson Harding knew it. He knew that William Peace was not going to get to that ball in time to have a play, and Lynchburg wins it. They move to 17-0 at Fox Field. Evan, Hornets 28-4 now on the season. The winning streak is up to eight in a row for Lynchburg. They've won 15 out of 16. Ben Jones putting the muscle into that one to get it to the fence and get on third base. What an effort from the Pacers throughout this game. They really kept things close the entire way. It never really felt like this lead was safe for either of the ball clubs. But as you said, who better than Ben Jones to come across the plate, two triples in this ball game that really ended up being decisive. And ultimately, Lynchburg still undefeated at home. Major props to Alex Giannascoli. How about the way he threw the baseball? and even go back to some of those earlier guys that came out of the pen for Lynchburg. Uh, Mason McDowell, Angel Collazo, Baylor Cumbie, Logan Tapman, Josh Jorman started it. Some good defensive work again for Lynchburg, and they get a victory, a hard-fought victory, an understatement right there, Evan. So much, so much fun here again from Fox Field. We'll end it there, fans. We really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching. Lynchburg is on the road this Sunday, taking on third-ranked Shenandoah. That'll be a key ODAC doubleheader. And then they head to Hampton, Sydney Tuesday. We are next on LHSN Wednesday as Lynchburg will host Greensboro. We'll say so long for now, baseball fans. Hope you enjoyed it. Lynchburg. They get win number 28 on the season, undefeated at 17-0 at Fox Field. They walk it off against William Peace, 7-6, the Hornet victory.